right guys, so for today's case, it is 10.27 p.m. January 2003, and we are in Ramapo, New York. Which, if you, like me, had never even heard of Ramapo, New York before today, it's about an hour and a half outside of New Jersey and about an hour outside of New York, New York. It's very much a quiet suburban town, which I feel like we always say about all of these small towns and all of these cases. But anyways, on the night in question, a woman calls in to say that her neighbor ran next door to her house screaming and crying that his wife was dead. So emergency services are dispatched right away. At this point, they don't know if this woman is alive or dead. The man on the phone with 911, her husband, he said he didn't stop to render her any aid because he felt as though she was beyond help and it was very dark. He said he, when he went to go flip the light switches on, they would not come on. And the couple share a son who was with him as well, a toddler. So he grabbed the baby and you know got out of there and went to the neighbor. So when police and first responders, paramedics arrive on the scene, they do see that this woman is beyond help she's passed away but to them this crime scene is very fresh they felt as though whatever had happened to her had just happened so their next step is to clear the home and make sure nobody else is you know hiding anywhere after they clear the home and make sure no one else is hiding anywhere detectives come in to look at the crime scene and check out their victim and the most alarming thing about this crime scene is that the victim has a large kitchen knife sticking out of her chest. The crime scene is very brutal. Her throat had been cut to the point where her spine had been exposed. She had three stab wounds to the chest. They think the kitchen knife was left in her chest because whoever had done this to her had stabbed the knife so deep that it was stuck in the flooring underneath her body. Because they felt as though the crime had just happened and her husband had walked in on it, you know, after the fact, there was no rigor mortis. There's also no signs of a struggle. Nothing in the house is in disarray. And she also doesn't have any defensive wounds. So they don't think there was any type of, you know, struggle. This was a quick, like, in and out type of thing. And whoever this was must have snuck up on her. And their, and their suspicions are pretty much confirmed. Remember I said the victim's husband said he flipped on the light switches but the lights weren't coming on? It's because all of the light bulbs had been removed and they were tossed in the trash. And there was another side light on the wall and the light bulb that was supposed to be in there had been loosened. So it looks like whoever had done this to our victim was there before she got there and was waiting for her to come home. So this probably was not, you know, something random. So their victim is Evelyn Visage and her husband is Peter Visage. So obviously the first person they want to talk to is Peter. They take Peter in, but right off the bat, they don't feel like he has any type of involvement because like they said, their crime scene was so fresh. Peter didn't have any blood or anything on him. So they thought, you know, there's no way he's involved. And he also had their son the whole day. But they bring him into the station for a formal interview anyway. Evelyn and Peter met working at the Home Depot. And while initially not suspicious of Peter, once they get him into the station and start talking to him, they learn that he and Evelyn are going through a divorce. That Evelyn had filed for divorce because she was no longer happy in the marriage and they were just working on, you know, co-parenting. But he said even though, you know, they were going through this divorce, things were very amicable. They just had, you know, different opinions on how their household should be run. Peter wanted to be the one to work and provide and have Evelyn stay home, but Evelyn didn't want to stay home. That's not what she saw for herself. She didn't see herself as a stay at home mom. And even though they were going through this divorce, they still lived together. So Peter says on the day of the murder, he hadn't seen her since the morning of when she was leaving for work and Peter took the baby to his parents' house and that's where the two of them were all day until about 8 p.m. 
Peter says at about eight, he called Evelyn to see if she had made it home yet. She said no. She was at a friend's house, but she was on her way home. She would be home soon. Peter goes on to say that he and the baby stopped to pick up some milk on the way home before heading to the house. He said when he got to the home, he flipped on the switch in the hallway, like in the entryway, and it didn't come on. He thought that was weird. He said he made his way to the bedroom, and that's where he saw Evelyn. He said he called out to her, but she didn't move. And he said after finding his wife that way, walking through the house and none of you know the light switches flipping on, he ran to the neighbor's house because he was spooked. And he's very cooperative with the detectives. He gives fingerprints, DNA samples, the whole shebang. So Peter is alibied. They have him on surveillance footage, buying the milk with the baby. His mom says he was at her house that day, which is something he often did because he didn't currently have a steady job and that his mom and dad would pay him to do things for them around the house. Y'all know once a month I sit down and do wing liner and it doesn't work out and I end up taking my makeup off halfway through the video. Today's one of those dates. <laughs> so let's just pretend the first makeup didn't happen. <laughs> We're gonna hop back into the case. So they're questioning Peter and they don't think that he is involved. So they start to ask him, well, like, what did he think was going on? Did he think this is a targeted attack? Are y'all mixed up in anything that would have y'all, you know, as a target for something like this? And Peter says no, and that he didn't really know what was going on. He says, but he did know that Evelyn had a boyfriend. And detectives are like, a boyfriend? So yeah, it's definitely a messy situation. Evelyn had a boyfriend, which is fine, but it's just, just awkward because she's still living with her husband they're going through a divorce but can they really even say they're separated if they're still living in the same house and this man also worked at home depot as well so they want to go to home depot to talk to evelyn's co-workers and this boyfriend and when detectives arrive evelyn's co-workers already were su su suspect su suspecting the worst wow because she hadn't shown up for work that day and she hadn't called in. The friend she had that worked there with her had called her, they were calling her phone and she wasn't answering. So when they saw detectives coming into their store, they already knew it was Evelyn, something was up. So they talked to Evelyn's boyfriend, his name is Michael Granda. He's 28, Evelyn was 36 at the time of her passing. They learned from Michael Granda that he was the friend she was with on the night of her murder. So that's a red flag. So Michael says on the day of the murder, they had not originally planned on spending time together because Evelyn had planned to get back home early to her son, but she had gone to the mall, to a nearby mall, to return some clothes after work and that Peter had called to let her know that he was gonna be staying later at his parents' house with the baby. So Evelyn was like, okay, well, I'm free. Let's, you know, hang out. So she went to Michael Granda's house and they had dinner there and hung out there for a while. Michael said that they had a nice, normal night before Evelyn decided to head back home. And that was it. That was the last he had seen of her. They look into Michael's background. They also get his DNA fingerprints, the whole shebang, same they did for Peter and they check his cell phone records and his cell phone records did not put him in the area of the murder because he lived about 40 minutes away from where Evelyn and Peter lived. He also would have had to pay on some toll roads to get to Evelyn and Peter's house and there was no indication or record of that. So they rule out Michael, then they rule out Peter. Now everybody is confused because they don't know who to look at or where to start. Everybody's a suspect. They don't know where to start. So what they do is to look at men in the area who were arrested for similar things, burglaries, and seeing who had an alibi and who didn't. And if you didn't have a solid alibi, they wanted to talk to you. One of the big things that they find is that there is a group of guys, younger men, who are going around doing burglaries. And one of these men in this burglary group, his name is Clarence and Terrence only lives five miles away from the Visage home, which is obviously a walking red flag. 
There's also a robbery that happened just a mile down the street from the Visage home that Terrence was 100% connected to. So they need to talk to him. So because Terrence is frequently dealing with the law, all the detectives know him. They know his name. They know how he is. They know if they bring him in and question him about this attack, and murder that he will not talk, he will not say anything. They already know what type of time he's on. So they decide to send out a criminal informant to talk to him as well and probe him for things and slowly get information to see, you know, where he might have been on the night of the murder. Okay, these lashes kind of look crazy. I feel like they're doing a lot. Are they? I don't know. We'll have to see what the rest of them make. <clears throat> but this criminal informant is able to determine that Terrence was nowhere near the murder scene at the time of Evelyn's attack. And after this, they check Terrence's phone records. And this also shows that he was not in town during the time of the murder. So detectives are back at square one after thinking they have a promising lead. They canvass the neighborhood again asking neighbors if they had seen anything out of the ordinary, if they had seen any suspicious cars in the neighborhood that Evelyn and Peter lived in. It wasn't allowed to park cars on the street. So like any unusual cars or anything like that would have stuck out and neighbors just hadn't seen anything. They re-interview her friends and family and coworkers and everybody's just adamant that this type of thing should not have happened to her. She didn't have any enemies. She was very nice, sweet, and compassionate to everybody that she came into contact with. Everybody loved her. All of her coworkers at the Home Depot that were younger than her got like that big sister type of vibe. There was no turmoil in her life that should have led to such a vicious attack. And while they had originally ruled Peter out, some people weren't so sure that Peter was not involved. One of those people being Michael Granda, her boyfriend. And one day, you know, as detectives are like twiddling their thumbs, confused as to where they're gonna take this case next, Michael Granda comes in with a box of Evelyn's belongings. And in this box of her belongings are some journals that she wrote in and some tape recordings. On these tape recordings, Evelyn had started to secretly record when she and Peter would have arguments, which seemed to be often, which is not something that Peter told detectives. They were often arguing about money. Peter thought that Evelyn spent too much money, which is crazy because she was the one working and he wasn't. In these recordings, they're also arguing over the custody of the child that they shared. Peter wasn't happy with how that was going. And after the divorce, Peter did not want Evelyn to be able to stay in the house. He wanted to be able to sell the home, which also was not turning out in his favor. When they want to catch back up to Peter, oh shit. When they want to catch back up to Peter to question them about these tapes and him having a possible motive, he retains an attorney and refuses to speak to them. Red flag, red flag. So with all this suspicion building, they're able to get a search warrant to search Peter's car. So in the back of his van, chow, they find $3,700 in cash, straight hundreds. And they're like, you know, what the heck is this? They also find like a minutes card in his back pocket of the car. And for someone who has a cell phone and a landline, what you doing with this minutes card? They also felt as though Peter ain't have no business having $3,700 in cash because he ain't have no money in the bank. And they're unsure of where this money could have came from, but I'm gonna leave his pockets out of this. Obviously finding this cash, their first mind is murder for hire. But because he didn't even have this money in the bank, they can't prove, you know, that this was withdrawn, you know, to be paid to a hitman. But what they can do is see who he was calling <clears throat> using this minutes card. And this is where they kind of have like their old shit moment. So he's been using this minutes card 
since November. Remember this happened in January. And he had used it to make 44 phone calls to one number. And the phone call stopped the day of the murder. So they look into the number and Peter had been calling a man by the name of Frank. And when they look Frank up, he has a very long rap sheet. And he was actually currently locked up when they were looking into him because he had turned himself in for a, for a big parole violation. He was on a super strict parole and he was pulled over for drinking and driving and he had a gun in the car. So he had to take that ass back to jail. They also check Frank's cell phone records and realize that he was near the Visage home the day before and the day of the murder. So they also get a search warrant for Frank's home and on his computer they find directions from his apartment to the Visage home. So police have all of this evidence but it's very much circumstantial. There's no real DNA evidence that's sticking, you know, Peter and Frank to the case. So what they decide to do is go talk to Frank at the county prison. Okay, but they set Frank up for the okie doke. They bring him into a room. They have their evidence posted up. They have maps on the wall with pins in it from his house to the, to the Visage house. They have evidence boxes piled up high with Evelyn's name on them, you know, making it look like they have piles and piles and piles of all this evidence against him. Detectives, they tell him, they say, we, we already know what happened, even though they don't. They say, we already know what happened. You need to confess because murder for hire you could be doing time, hard time. The death penalty, if you go ahead and confess to what happened that night, you know, we can work on getting you some type of deal, but you gotta confess right here and right now. And that was enough for Frank. He started to confess and detectives can tell that he was carrying the burden of this murder, you know, pretty heavily. He was in distress as he should have been, I mean, you know. Frank says he was approached by Peter to kill Evelyn for $5,000, that he needed, and that he needed most of his money up front and that he would be paid the rest after. He said that after getting his deposit, I guess you could say, that Peter was pressing him like, hey, when are you gonna do it? When are you gonna do it? When are you gonna do it? I gave you your money. I got the rest of your money. You need to hold up your end of the bargain. So he eventually works up the gumption, the gall, to go and commit this murder. He said the two of them, Frank and Peter, had actually met up at the home the day before so Peter could give him the layout of the house. And Peter, and on the night of the murder, Peter had left the back door unlocked for Frank. That's why there was no signs of forced entry. He said that on the night of the murder, he made it to the home. He knew what time to expect Evelyn at the house, so he unplugged or unscrewed, removed the light bulbs <clears throat> and waited for her to get home. He said when she did arrive that she was, of course, startled, but he calmed her down by telling her that, you know, this was just a burglary. And as long as she cooperated, he wasn't going to hurt her. He said, he said he stabbed her twice. She fell to the floor, to her knees. And this is when he cut her throat. He said he could hear the sound of the blade scraping across her spine. That he stabbed her again and left the knife stuck in her chest and then let himself out the back door. So with Frank's full confession, they're able to get a warrant for Peter's arrest and they go after him for the murder of his wife, Evelyn. For Frank's involvement and for his cooperation, he's given 20 years. Peter does not plead guilty. November 2003, Peter stands trial for the murder of his wife. Peter does not take the stand in his own defense, but obviously Frank's confession, his testimony is all the prosecution really needs. Frank gets on, he tells the same story he told to detectives. He also tells the jury that at the end before Evelyn was like dead. He told her, you know, what happened, why he was there and that, you know, Peter had sent him and that she was shocked. And that's, you know, one of the last things she had to hear before she passed. 
And of course, this case is a slam dunk with Frank's testimony. The jury deliberates for only three hours before coming back with a guilty verdict for Peter. They found him guilty of murder in the first degree and he is sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Their son that they shared was sent to live with Peter's family, which is probably not what Evelyn would have wanted, but Evelyn is originally from Puerto Rico. She moved to the United States at 19, so I'm assuming she probably didn't even have family here or close enough of kin here for her son to go to. But that is a wrap. Oh, I should probably unwrap my hair, huh? Oh well, we're here now. That is the wrap on today's case. Before we close out, we have a true crime TikTok, which is actually crazy. It's kind of a fun one. Ciao. When I tell you these two are trending and it ain't good, we gotta get into this story. So y'all remember back in 2021 when Donald Trump had pardoned Lil Wayne as well as Kodak Black, right? Well, the story begins here with this tweet by Keith Oberman, and he states that Rudy Giuliani's ex assistant is suing him for $10 million. And in her claim that she made, she said that she has a recording of Rudy Giuliani telling her that him and Trump were selling pardons for the low, low price of 2 million wrecks. Now, remember when the story surfaced, because people could not figure out how exactly did Lil Wayne and Kodak Black get on the president's good list? It only cost them $2 million each. Let me take you back a little bit. So little Wayne had a weapons charge that was really, really old. And somehow the prosecutor's office decided to hit him with it. They stated that he could get up to 10 years in prison. And when he pled guilty, nobody could figure out why. Well, insert the president of the United States at the time. Nobody can actually take a pardon unless you are convicted of a crime. So for the low, low price of allegedly $2 million, little Wayne ponied up. He then put out this tweet. And at the time, Kodak Black also got pardoned and he put out this tweet. Now he went ahead and deleted it. And we're not entirely sure why, but it's safe to say it looked like he was trying to clean up the crumbs. Now we gotta put our political science hats on because this is an ethical dilemma that we don't really know how it turns out. You cannot revoke a pardon, but if it was under unusual circumstances, what does that mean? Does that mean that the Supreme Court has to step in and really look at all of those pardons that Donald Trump was issuing? We don't exactly know, but we'll keep you posted on that story. Nice chain. The crazy thing is about it is that it makes sense. Like, it makes a whole lot of sense. Sounds pretty plausible. Can you imagine if that's true? And if it's actually a, like, girl. Like, do y'all remember how confused we all were? Well, not maybe all of us, but I was definitely confused when that happened because, what? It definitely sounds like the plot of a BET exclusive. And then last night I scrolled across a TikTok. She didn't have like her save feature on, so I can't put the video in this video, but I'm gonna put a screenshot right here so you can go check it out if you want. But she's talking about Aaron Carter's death. Y'all remember Aaron Carter? She was saying that his mom had released his crime scene photos, um, you know, after, well not crime scene photos, but the scene of his death. Um, she'd released them on Facebook. And when she first started talking, I was like, oh, she must be like grieving really heavy. Like she's probably losing it. But then as I watched the video, Aaron Carter's mom released these images because she felt as though there was some sort of foul play involved. Um, like I said, I'll put the screenshot right here so you can see the girls at and go see the video. <clears throat> it's kind of graphic. It's not the nicest thing you'd ever want to see, you know? So if you're not into that kind of thing, if you're easily triggered by that kind of stuff, um, but I wanted to include that today because I thought it was very interesting, but that is a wrap. I guess we just doing the whole video with the bonnet on. I'll take it off for the intro. I'll take it off for the intro. This is no better. <laughs>
in the Trinity Alps Preserve that seem to be abandoned but like ransacked. So police get out there and they start looking around and they realize that the campsite wasn't really ransacked but there seemed to be like some sort of like fight or a struggle that had taken place. Maybe even like an animal attack or some sort. There is blood everywhere. Things, things from the campsite had been thrown about. And whoever was at the campsite had taken off and like gotten the in a hurry, okay? There was one tent still standing, like whoever was there didn't even take their tent with them. But detectives also realized that there's one space that there looked like there was a tent standing that had been removed. So as they continue to look around, they come across a can of like baked campfire beans. You know how people like eat beans or whatever around a campfire? I don't know because I've never partaken in beans or a campfire. That's not my thing. But y'all know like that's a thing, right? They find this can of beans that has kind of been dented in. It has blood and hair stuck to it. So where they were originally kind of thinking this was some sort of animal attack, this can of beans is starting to look like some sort of a weapon and they're thinking that this may be some sort of a crime scene so they switch gears to treat the scene as a crime scene and they also bring out a cadaver dog so the cadaver dog is sniffing around and he alerts to the campfire or what remained of the campfire So of course, because the dog is alerting to their little campfire scene, they start to pull the debris, the logs and things that they had on this pile off. They start to uncover a partially burnt body. This was a woman's body and she was naked and there was a garbage bag tied around her head. When the garbage bag around her head was removed, they could tell that her head had been bashed in pretty severely, probably with the can of beans that they had found at the scene. And as well as being partially burned, she was covered in bruises. She had been beaten up very badly and her wrist had also been cut. So after finding the body, they continued to process their crime scene. And eventually they find a purse and inside of this purse is an ID. The woman on this ID is Laura Sinner. And they're pretty sure this is the body they found at the campsite from the picture. But they want to confirm first through dental records. Laura was originally from Washington. She grew up on a farm with two older brothers and her mom and dad, of course. She was bright and bubbly and she was always ready to help and like a natural caregiver. She and her brother grew up in the church, very religious because it was very important to Laura's mother. And it says that her mother was a very giving, charitable person as well. And that she even started fostering children as her kids got older <clears throat> as Laura was like in her late teens and it said that Laura loved this as well she loved helping her mom with the kids that she fostered Laura was a great kid a great daughter and after her freshman year of college she moved to Aberdeen Washington and she was working for a church out there helping them do like mission work um, passing out food to the homeless or less fortunate that kind of thing she was only 19 at the time so she's working at this little supper food situation at the church passing out hot plates and serving food and there was one guy who would often come through for a hot meal and his name was Tim Smith they both took a liking to each other so much so that Tim started working at the church as well passing out food so that the two of them could spend more time together so they eventually started a relationship during the summer so they met in the beginning of Laura's summer from college but their little relationship fling didn't really last too long so they broke up towards the end of summer around August this was really devastating for Laura. This was her first love. A summertime romance that was just so important to her and like 
she did not take the breakup very well. And fortunately, in October, just a few weeks after the big breakup, she would suffer another devastating loss. Laura's mom, who was very important to her, passed away suddenly from leukemia. And the leukemia took Laura's mother very quickly. It says she went into the hospital on the 8th of October and passed away on the 31st. And the death of her mother leads her to reconnecting with Tim. This all happened in 1997. They get back together and they decide to move to Tim's hometown in Reading, California for like a change of pace, a change of scenery. So in March of 1998, Laura and Tim move to his hometown. So at just 20 years old, Laura left. She packed up her car. She told her family that she and Tim had planned on getting married and they wanted to live their life and start a family in Redding, California. And unfortunately, just a month into her time in California, she was found dead at the campsite. So this brings us back to the campsite. They bring Laura's body in for an official autopsy and her cause of death is found to be blunt force trauma to the head, which is obviously what detectives had originally suspected anyways. And her blood alcohol level was extremely high, 0.78, which is actually past a person's physical limit. Like she would have to have been force fed liquor to be this drunk because she would have blacked out long before she got to this point. You know what I'm saying? And because Laura was found so badly bruised and beaten, they're thinking that she was out in the woods and that she was tortured. So they confirm her identity 100% through dental records before notifying the family. And of course her family is devastated to find out that Laura had been murdered in such a brutal way out in the woods at only 20 years old. The family was just in complete shock and had a hard time believing that it was her and to lose Laura so soon after the death of their mother. It was a lot to bear. And her father tells detectives that he had actually been very worried about her while she was in California, that he hadn't heard from her and he actually went to local police in Salem, Washington, where they lived and reported her missing because he hadn't heard from her. But after reporting her missing, she went ahead and called him <clears throat> and she said that she and Tim had broken up but that she was gonna stay in California which her family did not want her to do. They all wanted her to come back home, her father and her brother. They offered to send gas money so she can get her way back home, but she wanted to stay. Laura's father told detectives that he hadn't heard from her since, since about April 1st, which made sense to detectives because the autopsy had determined that she had been dead for about two weeks before she was found. So obviously the first person they want to talk to is Tim Smith because she, <clears throat> because he's the only one, you know, that her family knows that she knows in California. He's the whole reason that she went in the first place, so he has to be involved. So they bring him in for an interview. So when detectives tell Tim that Laura had been murdered, he is floored. He's very taken aback. He's sick, disgusted, and he claims he had no idea. He said he hadn't talked to Laura in a couple of weeks because they just couldn't stop arguing. That's why they had broken up in the first place because they just were arguing all the time. He said he hadn't talked to her in a couple of weeks and he was out doing his own thing, but that during the time that they had been there, Laura had made really good friends with his sister, Lori. So Lori Smith, Tim's sister, and Paul Smith, Tim's brother, live in the house with their father, Paul Sr. <clears throat> Paul Sr. doesn't come up, so we're gonna call Paul the brother Paul. And the Lori slash Laura might be a little confusing, so I'm sorry about that. But, but she had become friends with Tim's siblings. And after they broke up, she had decided to stay in Reading. And she was living in Paul's house with Lori and Paul Jr., okay? And apparently she had really hit it off with him. Lori and Laura connected very well. 
So Tim is telling detectives that, you know, he hadn't talked to any of them and detectives don't really believe him because these are your siblings. She's living in your father's house. Like how have you not like talked to any of them? And Tim just, <clears throat> and Tim explains to detectives that he didn't grow up very close to his siblings or his father because they spent a lot of time in foster care, that they were often separated and they would go long periods of time without seeing each other as, you know, a result of being in the system. And as they aged out of the system, Tim tried to take the straight and narrow path and get his life together, whereas his sister and brother, Lori and Paul, were into the crime of it all, you know? and they weren't interested in making an honest living. And so obviously their differences in lifestyle just drew them apart even further. And it wasn't until later that they reconnected with their father and moved in with their father. But they're all still very young. And Lori and Paul became super close because they were both into the crimeation of the situation. Lori was in and out of juvenile hall for different things. Paul was a car thief and he did a lot of burglaries, that kind of thing. So they bonded over that. And they also got closer because Lori started dating Paul's best friend, Eric. And these are the people Laura had been spending her last couple of dates with because she was living with them. So Tim tells detectives, you know, you need to go talk to them, not me. And that's exactly what detectives go out to do. So as they go to check in on this lead from Tim, before they can go out and talk to the people in question, a witness comes into the police station saying she has information on Laura's murder. So the person that comes into the police station is 14 year old Amy Stevens. Amy Stevens says she is Paul Smith's girlfriend, Paul who is 20 at the time. Amy Stevens was in the foster care system as well. When she met Paul, Paul convinced her to run away from the foster home and to come be with him and that is what she did. So the two of them obviously spent a lot of time together. And she tells detectives that she was present at the time of the murder. I'm about to put a rhinestone over this pimple and pretend it doesn't exist. But Amy tells detectives that on April 7th, they all decide to go out camping. And so Laura drives them all out to the Trinity Alps Preserve in her car. So it was Paul and Amy, they're a couple. It was Lori and Paul's best friend, Eric Rubio, that I told you guys about earlier, they're a couple. And Laura is there kind of like the fifth wheel. But they're out in the woods camping, drinking, smoking, having a good time. And Amy says the energy kind of shifts when Laura starts to come on to Paul. There's a little bit of flirting and there is apparently a kiss. And Amy said this kiss really pissed her off. <clears throat> okay, my camera battery died. I don't remember exactly where we left off, but there was a kiss between Laura and Paul. And this really pissed Amy off. 14 year old Amy didn't want Laura kissing her man, which is so comical coming from a 14 year old girl. Like I know the detectives listening to her story had to be like, girl, pick up a book, read a book, go to school, GD, something. You're only 14. But Amy says that after this, it made her so mad. She got up and she punched Laura, punched her, knocked her out. Not really, but punched her. And then she says, Laura got up, pushed her like, uh, pushed her ass down and then got on top of her and started letting her ass have it. So Amy getting beat up. Then she says that because she was getting beat up that Paul stepped in and pulled Laura off of her and this is where things got crazy. She said that Paul grabbed the can of beans and started hitting Laura with the can of beans until Laura was unresponsive, not dead, but just like, you know, you get hit in the head with a can of beans unwell. Then she said that the can of beans just was not enough for Paul, that he went and got a dent puller, not one of the small like suction cuppy dent pullers, like one of the big long ones. And he started hitting her in like the back of the head and neck area with the dent puller until they all heard her neck snap. 
that Paul had bludgeoned her to death in the woods before covering her with this debris and starting a small fire. She said she was mad at Laura for kissing Paul, but she never, you know, wanted her to die. That it was just supposed to be a little, you know, cat fight and call it a day, but Paul took it too far. She also confirms for detectives that Tim was not there and had no involvement or even knew that they were going out camping. He was totally in the dark. Amy said she finally worked up the courage to come to talk to detectives after being scared of Paul and what he, else he might do. So next detectives want to talk to Lori. So Lori is talking to detectives and she starts to give a slightly different story. Whereas Amy had said the altercation had started between she and Laura. Lori says that Paul was the one who started beating up Laura first. She says that because Laura had been like drunkenly flirting with Paul, that she had grabbed his butt and had kissed him on the cheek. This made Paul like increasingly upset and this is why Paul started to attack her. Lori went on to say that after attacking Laura for a while, he decided to tie her up to a tree and he handed her a box cutter so that she could cut her wrist so it would look like a suicide. That she decided to take her own life, not that she was beaten to death, even though they had already beaten her up pretty bad. So he handed her the blade for her to like cut her own wrist, but she wasn't <clears throat> doing a good enough job for him. And so this is when he decided to force feed her a handle of whiskey because he didn't want her to feel any pain. So he force feeds her the liquor and then he goes to cut her wrist. But Lloyd went on to say that things just weren't happening fast enough for Paul. And this is when he picked up the dip puller and started hitting her, hitting her, hitting her in the back of the neck. They heard her neck snap. So similar to Amy's story at the end, Lori also tells detectives that Paul and Eric Rubio had put her under this debris pile together and that Paul had threatened everybody. He said he would kill all of them if any of them said anything. Their stories are similar enough. It seemed as though just in Lori's story, she was trying to protect Amy and x out Amy's involvement in the original altercation. So they want to talk to Paul and Eric Rubio now. Luckily, they're already in custody because they were stealing cars. They were caught driving a stolen Jeep. So they were already in the jailhouse waiting to be talked to. And they talked to Eric Rubio first. And first, Eric Rubio, he's playing blind, deaf, and dumb. He acts like he has no idea what they're talking about until detectives tell him that they found out from the girls what happened, they've got their side of the story, now they just need his. This is when he starts to talk. So Eric Rubio tells detectives a similar story to Amy's in the sense that the altercation started between Amy and Laura, but instead of Paul jumping in, it was Lori who jumped into the fight. Rubio goes on to say that unlike the other two girls, stories that as Amy was getting beat up Lori jumped in and then Amy was the one who picked up the can of beans and started hitting Laura with the can of beans <clears throat> but it says that Amy just wasn't getting getting it in good enough so then Lori starts hitting Laura with the can of beans and that the two of them together really do a number on Laura. Eric Rubio said that Lori hit Laura in the can, in the head with the can, a lot. A lot, a lot. To the point where Laura couldn't even stand up on her own. And that Laura was laying on the ground crying because she was like stumbling. She couldn't get her footing because she had been hit in the head so much. And it's like after the cool down, after everything kind of settled, the girls kind of realized how badly they had beaten Laura. And this is when they kind of walked her over to a nearby creek and tried to help her like rinse herself off, rinse the blood and dirt in her hair. And it's after they had cleaned her off that they had realized the damage that Lori had done to the back of her head. They could see her skull crushed in. And Eric said that Paul didn't initially go to tie her up to the tree, but the girls had left her propped up against the tree and to keep her from like slumping over and falling, Paul tied her to the tree. 
And this is when he decided to cut her wrist to try to make it look like a suicide. Eric said that again, similar to the girls, that she wasn't dying fast enough, things weren't happening soon enough for Paul. And this is when he decided to start bludgeoning her with the dent puller. And he says, and Eric says that they were all waiting inside of the tent, but they could hear the sound of the beating and that they all heard the sound of her neck snapping. So he cuts her wrist, he's force feeding her the alcohol and he's beating her, trying to get her to pass away. And Eric says that after this, Paul threatened his life in order to get him to help conceal her body under this debris, under this wood pile. And while all of the stories are different in their own way, they all implicate Paul in being the one who like took it there, okay? And when they finally catch up to Paul to talk to him, he basically says the same thing that everybody else had been saying, that after the girls had gotten into a fight, he didn't think that she was gonna survive. So instead of taking her to a hospital or anything like that, he decided to put her out of her misery. And that's why everything that happened happened. But he was very straightforward with his involvement. So all four of them are indicted for her murder. Paul's mugshot. Eric Rubio and Lori Smith both take plea deals, you know, agreeing to testify against Paul Smith. They both got 15 years. And Amy, obviously, because she was only 14 years old, was sentenced to like the maximum for a juvenile. So she was eligible for parole in 10 years at the age of 25. So in 2002, Paul Smith Jr. is the last person to go on trial. And Paul Smith, during the trial, stood by the fact that he was just putting her out of her miser misery and like putting her down like she was a dog on side of the road because he was certain that she wouldn't survive the beating that the girls had given her. The jury did not like facts and he was sentenced to death. So in 2009, Amy Stevens was released. Eric Rubio was released in 2015. And in 2021, Lori Smith was released. And eventually Paul Smith's life sentence was overturned and changed to just a life in prison without the possibility of parole, which was a Supreme Court thing that he did not really deserve because he was even charged with attempted murder of a prison guard while he was in jail. So is there any rehabilitation happening? Probably not, okay? He and another inmate had attacked an officer in the shower area with a shower grate it took this officer 14 months in the hospital to recover from the injuries he suffered and they still let Paul Smith leave death row. What the hell? What the hell? What the hell? I'll link that article down below if you want to read it yourself. Um, and if I forget to link the article, just remind me, don't give me no attitude. Okay? It don't take all of that. Just remind me. <laughs> Sometimes from like the point that a YouTuber or whoever you're watching says that they're gonna link something to the point that the video actually goes up, it could be days, weeks, so we just forget, okay? So just remind me. But that is a wrap on today's True Crime and Makeup video. Make sure you subscribe before you leave and I will see y'all next time. Bye guys. Mother of three children, this enrages me. Calls for justice across the country after a Kansas City teen went to the wrong home to pick up his younger brothers and the homeowner shot him. 16 year old Ralph Yarl is recovering in the hospital in stable condition. His family describes him as a typical high schooler who loves to play the bass clarinet. Officers arrived at the scene after a neighbor called 911 and took the homeowner immediately into custody. The homeowner, who has not been identified, was released after 20 24 hours pending further investigation. A person can be held up for 24 hours for investigation of a felony, at which time they're required by Missouri law to be charged or released. Authorities here say they need more evidence. They want to talk to this teenager and they want to continue this investigation. So he was released and it's part of the reason why people are so upset this morning and why they're asking for justice.
my name is Kennedy. If you're new here, if you're not new, hey girl, how have you been? Welcome back to another True Crime and Makeup episode here on the channel. I have thinner brows today and a clock clip in. I feel like I'm giving very much Y2K. <laughs> I feel like I look so cute right now. I feel like I look so cute. I look so cute. <laughs> but we're gonna hop right into today's video. There's actually something that I'm really interested in talking to you guys about that i'm about to film right now it'll be a separate video and it's going to go up today before this video because i just I, we have to talk about it so i'm trying to get out of this video so we can film the next video but if this is your first time here make sure you subscribe before you leave and we can hop right in what is oh <laughs> This is a stack of lashes. When I tell y'all I'm obsessed with the Amazon lashes, I mean it, like I 100% mean it. I buy them way too often. But hi guys, how are you? Welcome back to the channel. I'm so excited to sit down and talk to you guys today. We didn't chit chat too much in the beginning of the last two videos because I was filming on a Sunday and that whole weekend, I had turned up a little, okay? I turned up a lot. Saturday, I was out all day. I went out Friday night, and then I took my out Sunday, which was a mistake, because Saturday night, I was so exhausted. You know how like you are so tired, you start to get like queasy, like I was so tired. I was nauseous, like I needed to get in the bed immediately, but I had a great, fun weekend. I feel like I'm yelling because my ears are stopped up, and I like, I know that I'm loud right now, but I, I can't hear. I've been so in love with my natural hair straight. I've been wearing a wig all year, you guys. All year. Y'all have not seen me in a wig all year. And it's coming up on April. That is so crazy. But I'm definitely about to put a wig back on so we can continue to grow our hair. I just feel like that's the best way to grow your hair under a wig. Like, especially for me, because I've got a sizable forehead. You know, so I can pull my wigs pretty far down and like I don't have to worry about like my edges being snatched out or whatever. The only time I really ever like lose my edges is like my sideburns, but like they grow back so fast. I really don't care. But anyway, child, we're going to hop into today's case. But first, remember we were talking about the perfume? I went and got it. It smells amazing. It smells divine. I think. Oh, my God. Oh why I'm so attracted to the scent I think it's the sweet rum if there was no rum like warm notes in here I probably wouldn't like this as much but y'all I'm talking about it today because I have it on with the way Saint Bart's body cream listen to me listen to me this combo is deadly assassination okay warm sexy sweet sultry like if you want your man to lick you up off the floor these two, it's gonna do it for you. Next time you go to Sephora, pick up the tester, put the body cream on your arm, rub it in, go to the other side of the store, pick up the perfume, spray it on your arm. Tell me, tell me I'm lying, tell me I'm lying. This is a delectable killer combo. Like, knock him out of the park. If I smelt this on somebody, I would want to lick them. I'll have them linked in the description, but go to Sephora and try it out. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, go to Sephora, pick these buff up, sample them, and just go about your day. Don't even buy them that day. Go about your day and then let me know how you feel. If you're a warm girl, gourmand, you like to smell sweet but still sexy. Like this is sweet but grown and sexy like, mm. All right guys, so for today's case, it's March 15th, 2008 and we are in New Mexico. On Highway 84, which is like a long strip, about 40 miles of highway, and it's, you know, just one of those long strips of road that you take on road trips going in between states, like not much around, okay? <laughs> this is gonna sound so stupid, but like I just kept thinking about my 600 pound life when I was thinking about um, Highway 84 because y'all know they have to take like the long trip to Dr. Now and he's in Texas in Houston I think and they can't fly because they're bigger so they're always like going down these long strips of road and like they have to pull over on side of the road and take breaks and remember the couple like their trailer broke or something and they were like stuck on that long strip of road and they had to leave stuff on side of the road like I kept thinking about that so early the morning of the 15th at around eight o'clock that morning a couple making their way down the highway 
passes up an abandoned car. And the woman, she's in the passenger seat and when they pass the car, she says that she thought she saw someone laying out on the opposite side of the car. And so, better than me, the couple decides to turn around and check it out to see if this is someone, you know, passed out on side the road, somebody that needs help. Maybe their car had broken down and in the heat of the day, they were just exhausted and laying out. The best I can do for you is call 911. The best I can do is call 911 from a distance, from a distance. But like I said, the couple, they double back to go check it out and they do find a man laying in the grass in a pool of his own blood. He was bleeding from the head and he was also duct taped around the mouth. So the couple obviously alarmed, they call 911 immediately. Because what the And I think this just is like so wild and crazy to me because I feel like road trips are the plot of every horror movie. Like every horror movie ever, it's a bunch of people get in a car and go on a road trip and find some bullshit on side of the road. So I could never stop, but shout out to these people because they did. So police come out and it's clear to them that this person had been shot in the back of the head. And because he was duct taped, it looked like somebody had brought him out on side of the road, shot him and left him. So after confirming that this man is, you know, dead beyond help on side the road, their next step is to try to figure out who he is. Like I said, there is a car parked near the body. The car has Texas license plates. And once they run the tags on the car, they realize that the car is registered to a man by the name of Thomas Hickman. And he was currently a missing person. He had been reported missing by his wife in Abilene, Texas. And from all accounts on paper, from what they could see, Thomas was a normal guy. He was a director of operations for Red Lobster, so he traveled a lot for work. Good job. He had um, a wife, a son. You know, no criminal history, nothing on record on paper that would lead him to be found, you know, shot dead on the side of the road. And he was reported just the day before by his wife because on one of his business trips, he was supposed to be at a, another Red Lobster in a different part of Texas, but he never showed. His work called to let his wife know that he never showed, and so she reported him missing. Side note for all my girls in Baton Rouge, have y'all seen that guy that was here on business and then they found him on the side of the road rolled up in a rug? They said there was no foul play involved because they think he had a drug overdose, but how did he end up rolled up in a rug? Literally rolled up in a rug on the side of the road. So because they really have no leads right off the bat, they decide to look into the couple that found him on the side of the road. And they question them, what y'all doing? What y'all got going on? What the hell is y'all doing here? Y'all just randomly came across this body on the side of the road. What's happening? But ultimately they decided that this couple was not involved and they were just genuinely good Samaritans, mainly because Thomas was 6'6". Six, 6'6", six. Six, six, grown ass man. Detectives felt if anybody was gonna lure him into the woods, not into the woods, I'm so used to saying that, <laughs> into the desert to kill him, it wasn't gonna be these two, okay? It, they would've needed some muscle. So since this was a work trip, they wonder if his death was work related, but they find out that Thomas was a great manager. His colleagues, coworkers loved him. And Thomas was just a stand-up guy and that stood out a lot to me while I was researching this case. Um, his son that I mentioned before had recently moved to Texas as well. They're originally from Florida. But Thomas and his son had planned on going to New Orleans to help rebuild after Hurricane Katrina, which I thought was really cool. Y'all know I was displaced in a flood, not Katrina, the flood of 2016 where it just didn't fucking stop raining. I've told y'all that before. It's been a minute since we talked about it, but like I was trapped in my house. There was water up to my fucking titties. 
and in 2016 i hadn't had my youngest son yet and my oldest i think he had just started pre-k and the water was literally up to my chest i had him wrapped around my neck and they literally pulled a boat up to my front door but anyway i thought that was pretty cool that they had planned to go to new orleans to help out so where thomas was found was like cattle land where you know you know when you're driving down the side of the road you see all the cows and stuff and you know how these stretches of land they have like the itty bitty little like itty bitty 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 thin like little strips of wire or whatever the heck it is that the, the cows don't cross for whatever reason the cows don't cross these little strips thomas was found on the other side of the little strips and the person tending to this land said he had been there last at around 9 30 the day before and he did not see thomas or the car the day before but other passers-by had reported seeing the car at around 4 a.m that morning but it's likely you know because it was still dark that nobody that none of those people saw thomas so as they process thomas's car a few things stick out and one of those things being is that remember i said thomas is 6'6 six, six. the driver's seat of his car was pulled up super close so they suspect thomas was not the one driving and his wallet and all of his belongings that he was traveling with were still in the car all his credit cards his money his laptop so this obviously wasn't any type of robbery so they processed the car and the surrounding areas and one thing that stands out to them is that wrapped up in some cactuses are some helium balloons. These balloons are like tangled into these cactuses. Some of them have popped from bumping into the cactus. And so they just go over, take a look at it, and they see that not only is it balloons tied to a string wrapped up in this cactus, but there's a gun attached to the strings as well. And this gun had kind of been damaged like parts of the gun were removed the serial number had been ground down it was weird it was weird as hell so detectives decide to look into his credit card re records to see why he was in new mexico what he had spent money on while he was in new mexico and to get an idea of where he had been in between and they get a hit they see that he had used his credit card at a gas station he had got gas and also made another small purchase inside so they go to this little gas station and they ask for surveillance footage and they see thomas on the surveillance footage he walks in he uses the bathroom and he purchases a candy bar and then he walks out that's it nothing crazy but they do feel like thomas is being followed a couple walks into the gas station directly behind him. They go to the restroom as well and they leave out right behind Thomas. But identifying this couple would literally be like finding a needle in a haystack to random people in a gas station, you know? But his colleagues do let detectives know that on the morning of his disappearance, he was scheduled to go in to Lubbock, Texas to fire someone. A manager by the name of Julio was said to just be doing unsavory things at work. He had had a lot of complaints and ultimately he had taken some time off work saying that a close family member of his was in a car accident, like a very bad car accident, but it turns out that that was a lie, okay? And on top of all the other complaints that he had, it was time for him to go. So on that morning, Thomas was supposed to go in and fire this man. So of course this like perks detectives ears up. So they want to talk to Julio of course and they find out that on the morning of the meeting Julio also didn't show up to work. So detectives are like mm -mm, what's going on they need to find him and ultimately when Julio gets word of what's going on he calls in to detectives because he didn't want no part. He did not want to be involved, speculated about, questioned, nothing. And he's very cooperative with detectives. And he was like, basically, I knew I was about to get fired, so I'm not going back in. Okay? If I'm about to get fired, I'm not, you're not about to fire me. No, not in my face. 
so he just decided to not go which been there done that okay why the am i about to come back here and talk to you about getting fired <laughs> i'm just not coming back and luckily Julio has a pretty strong alibi. He was actually in Louisiana and he was out and about looking for a different job, interviewing, that kind of thing. When the body was found, he in no way, shape or form could have been in New Mexico. So Julio is ultimately ruled out. So they continue to look through his financial records and they also get into the laptop that was in his car. They're looking through his search history and they find that he was searching for helium balloons. And he had made a purchase in store at a helium balloon shop. And y'all know we found the helium balloons at the crime scene so detectives are very confused. They go to the helium balloon shop and the clerk does say that she remembered Thomas because he's so tall, you know, he stuck out. And he stuck out because normally they do like online for fulfillment. Like it's very random and seldom that people come in to purchase their balloons. Have y'all been like seeing stuff about the helium shortage? Like there's a helium shortage on the planet. And like in a few years, the planet isn't even going to have helium. Have y'all seen that? Okay. Yeah. Anyway. So detectives are like, okay, we got him dead on the side of the road near his car. He was shot in the back of the head point blank range we found the helium balloons near the scene attached to this gun that's kind of been like deconstructed and we have thomas who had went in and purchased helium balloons what is going on so police in new mexico they decided to go out to texas to talk to thomas's wife and they found out that she is very sick she has ms as a family they had just been struggling you know in dealing with that. She said that their last interactions were an argument. She said she was feeling really bad when he left, like physically, like her health wise, she did not feel well. She was feeling really ill and he did not want to leave for work. He wanted to stay home with her, but um, she insisted that he go to work. And this caused an argument. They also find out that the family was kind of dealing with a lot of debt credit card debt as well as her medical bills. The family was dealing with a lot and with his wife's permission, they start to go through Thomas's belongings. In going through his things, they find what could only be considered as suicide notes. He wrote a letter to his wife and a separate letter to his son. In the letter to his wife, he wrote out <clears throat> what she should do in the event that something happened to him. Um, he wrote about her collecting life insurance policy payouts and what she should do with the money. He told her to pay off their credit card debt and then sell the home for extra money, stuff like that, like a very detailed plan. And in the note to his son, he just spoke to his son, you know, as a father, don't make the same mistakes I did, that kind of thing. So they also go into the garage and Thomas has like a work area and on this little workbench area there's shavings and remember I said that the serial number on the gun had been filed down they're wondering if these shavings are from the gun and that the decomposition of this gun was done in Thomas's garage and if he had done it himself. And eventually they're able to lift a serial number off the gun, even though it had been filed down and scratched into. And they're able to see that this gun was purchased by Thomas in January of the same year. And they are forensically able to determine that the shavings in the garage were from the gun. So detectives are like, what the hell is going on with the balloons, with the gun? And it's looking like a suicide, but they're just so confused. It just so happened another detective who wasn't direct, working directly with the case had seen an episode of a TV show where a man had used a gun to kill himself, but he wanted to make it look like a homicide. So he took the gun, tied it to a bunch of helium balloons. Obviously, after he shoots himself, the gun would float up away with the helium balloons, so it would look like a homicide, not a suicide. And they're wondering if maybe this is what Thomas had done. And as they continue to look through his belongings and search through his laptop, they also realized that he had been searching on how far helium balloons could lift something and how light that something would have to be for the helium balloons to take it far away. And they think that maybe this is why the gun had been like 
broken up into different little pieces really like just the trigger me mechanism of the gun was left okay so here's a picture of the gun with some of the ribbon still attached and you can see how a lot of the pieces have been removed and the little ring underneath the trigger had also been removed they think partially because he needed to make the gun lighter and also because in order for him to shoot himself in the back of the head he would have had to use his thumb and his thumb wouldn't have fit in the trigger hole in that little ring so he removed the ring and it's looking like Thomas killed himself and he wanted to make it look like a homicide because his life insurance because his life insurance policies would pay out more in the event of an accident. He bought the balloons, he bought the gun, he had written letters to his wife and to his son and he had also been searching these things on his computer and unfortunately I guess for Thomas his plan just didn't work the way he thought it would instead of the balloons floating away with the gun they got snagged in the cactus and ended up you know very close to his body this case is very similar to the other case we covered a few weeks ago um, where the man blew himself up in the hotel parking lot hoping for an insurance payout for his family so in researching this case i came across this other case that was extremely similar, not even extremely similar, damn near the same thing. So this is Alan Abrahamson, and he also shot himself and then lifted off the gun with a weather balloon. He was 71 years old and he lived in like a gated golf community, like country club type situation. And every morning he would get up early at around 5.30, 6 a.m. and walk to a coffee shop, have coffee with some colleagues or friends before coming back home. And on this morning in particular, in 2018, he did not come back home. His body was found in a field shortly outside of the gated community. He was actually found by a neighbor's dog and it was originally thought to be a homicide until they did the same thing police went through his search history through his computers they found that he had purchased a weather balloon and he had also purchased a helium tank shortly before the murder or the suicide rather and he too had also been googling about how heavy something had to be or how much helium he would need to lift something at a certain weight. He had also Googled undetectable suicide methods and his death was also ruled as a suicide, looking to gain some sort of large insurance payout for his family after his passing. Cops say he died of a gunshot wound to his chest, but no weapon was found with his body. Police put out calls to help them solve the crime, even offering a reward in the case. But now they're saying Abrahamson himself was the culprit all along. Investigators comb through his computer and phones to look for leads. But instead of finding suspects, they found receipts and emails for weather balloons, helium tanks, and rubber bands. They also say his search history turned up questions about whether life insurance companies pay out policies in the event of a suicide. Cops say Abrahamson had run through his retirement savings and staged a homicide so his family would get his life insurance money. Police say they still have not found the gun, which could have been carried more than 100,000 feet in the air by the balloon. The perfect murder foiled by a digital paper trail. And from the brief look I had, this has happened a couple of different times where people have seen this CSI episode and have done similar things. I tried to find the episode of CSI. I don't know if I said that before, but it was an episode of CSI where the balloon situation happened. It was probably scrubbed from the face of the earth after all these people started committing suicide by balloon. But it's a crazy phenomenon that I had never heard of. I'd never heard of any of these. I'd never seen the CSI episode. So I was very intrigued by this case. And I cannot wait to hear what you guys think in the comments down below. And ultimately, it just sucks. It's another tale of, you know, a man making the ultimate sacrifice, trying to fix, you know, where he thought he had messed up. And ultimately, his plan just didn't go, you know, the way he wanted it to. And I think that's 
sucks. His wife still was able to get a life insurance policy payout, but obviously way less than what it would have been if he had not died by suicide. Hey guys, so I forgot to mention that they theorized that he went to New Mexico to be, you know, in an out open deserty type of environment without a lot of trees that could snag his balloons but before we close out today's video today's true crime at tiktok was actually suggested by one of you guys so shout out to you girl thank you for the recommendation because it's absolutely insane i had briefly looked into it because i saw it on the phil defranco show but i had not seen this tiktok yet and it is insane did you know that a man recently faked a live stream to create an alibi so he could murder a pregnant woman on december 18th 2022 natalie mcnally a 32 year old who was 15 weeks pregnant was brutally murdered in what lawyers are calling a sophisticated calculating and cool headed plot on december 19th 2022 stephen mccullough notified authorities after finding a gory scene at Natalie's home in a delightful residential neighborhood in Northern Ireland. Stabbed 18 times, she and her son in utero, whom her family are now calling Baby Dean, were dead. McCullough was arrested that same day, but quickly ruled out as a suspect. The 32-year-old YouTuber had an alibi for the night of her murder, a six-hour-long live stream playing Grand Theft Auto Vice City, for his channel of about 37,000 subscribers. He had texted Natalie telling her about the live stream that afternoon and promoted it publicly on his social media, calling it the Violent Night Christmas Live Gaming Stream. Despite having an alibi, detectives were unconvinced. Detective Chief Inspector Neil McGinnis thought there was something fishy about Steven's live stream, saying he spoke throughout continually, but did not speak to the people who were responding live, citing technical issues as an excuse for his limited interactions. Then, detectives became aware that you could pre-record and stream as if live. Game changer. Because next, a team of cyber experts examined the footage and Steven's devices and declared that the footage had been pre-recorded. Bingo. McCullough was re-arrested on January 31st, 2023, at which point he conceded in a written statement to police that he pre-recorded the live stream on December 13th and 14th and streamed it the night of the 18th. However, he maintains his innocence and says the night of the murder, he was drinking alone in his home and fell asleep. But a combination of CCTV evidence and witness testimony of Stevens' whereabouts that night would point to the contrary. CCTV footage shows a man officials believe is Steven boarding a bus heading towards Natalie's home. In the video, the man is seen wearing a distinctive yellow glove underneath a black glove while passing chains to the bus driver. Detectives say the yellow glove is consistent with traces of a marigold colored cleaning glove found in Natalie's blood spatter at the crime scene. Moreover, a taxi driver confirmed that Steven arrived at his home by taxi at about 11.13 p.m. that night. This timing would corroborate another important piece of evidence. Detectives found no activity on Steven's phone between 6 p.m. and 11.16 p.m. the night of the murder, three minutes between when the taxi reportedly dropped him off and use on his phone began. If it's a coincidence, it's a wild one. But lawyers say some of the most chilling evidence that Steven is capable of deception beyond imagination is his continued interference with Natalie's family in the wake of her death. He only met them briefly twice before, but when he came to their home, they welcomed him in. And he was caught leaving his phone there on purpose, during which time he recorded 40 minutes of audio. Detectives believe the invasion of privacy was an attempt to inquire into the progress of the police investigation and to see whether there's any suspicions around him. The effort certainly backfired. Lawyers urged the judge to refuse Stevens' bail for fear of further tampering with witnesses, a request the judge granted. The judge said of the case that, at present, mostly hangs on the fact that the live stream was not actually a live stream. And I quote, I don't know that I've ever come across a case that is so complex, that if the police are right, this was a cold-blooded attack which was meticulously planned with absolutely tragic consequences. And in all the circumstances, I also am concerned about the issues which the prosecution are concerned with. The risk of further offending, if he can carry out an attack like this, if the police case is right, then who knows what else he is capable of. The case is still ongoing, and as the trial continues to unfold, Natalie's family have asked to grieve privately. They say of this difficult period, the bottom has fallen out of our world. I don't see any future anymore. 
but they also hope to use our platform to call for an immediate end to violence against women and girls. And for today's case, we are in Daytona Beach. Fun fact, if you're not new here, you know I used to work at Hooters. I bartended at Hooters for a while. And I've bartended at other places, but I worked at Hooters for the longest. And we had a wing flavor called Daytona Beach. And the amount of times I've had a man mansplain Daytona Beach to me. Oh, do you know, do you know why the wings are called Daytona? Do you know what Daytona? I'm triggered, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like the most uh, annoying thing, but for today's case, we're in Daytona Beach. Daytona Beach is home to the Daytona 500, was like, which is like a big NASCAR thing, which actually takes place in February. I don't know if it's happened already, but again, things I know from working at Hooters. I almost said Florida, so country, Florida. So we're in South Daytona Beach, Florida on August 25th, 2010. So there's a mobile home in South Daytona called Twin Oaks Mobile Home. And there's a woman who's been missing for a few weeks and her car turns up in the parking lot of the Twin Oaks Mobile Home. So obviously detectives and a tow truck are called out to the scene to collect her vehicle. So they're towing this car and nothing extremely out of the ordinary or anything that would like perk up the ears of detectives is happening. Aside from the fact that they can kind of smell something it's a little funky out there, but they're at a trailer park, so they don't think anything of it. I, I'm sorry, that sound is so mean. If you live in a trailer, I don't mean it like that. That's just how they took it, okay? Not, not, not me. I've been inside of some very nice trailers. So they do their thing, the tow truck puts it in reverse, but as the tow truck is maneuvering around, it turns on its bright lights, and its bright lights shine into some nearby woods, and they can tell that in these woods, randomly, there's a trash can. Like one of the really big black trash cans. Like if you have um, like community trash cans, like the certain ones that the trash truck picks up on its own, like that have the lid attached, one of those, okay? And the trash can is open. So they just go to check it out. They've got this missing woman. They found her car. There's a trash can in the woods. So they go peek into this trash can. They got a big peek. There is a body in the trash can so obviously this isn't just like some little toe and go situation anymore they have to treat this scene as a crime scene tape it off everybody stop everybody out it's a crime scene and since it's already kind of late at night they decide to secure the scene and just wait until the light of day for them to bring in a forensics team and move the body and start collecting evidence so like i said this is late august in south florida it's hot hot so the body is very badly de decomposed and right off the bat they're not able to identify this person or tell if it's male or female they have to send it in for further um, forensic testing so they don't yet know if it's the missing woman whose car they found this missing woman her name is Goldie Robinson and she is a senior citizen she's 78 and I say that to say she's not like just up and going missing of course she's retired she chilling she ain't going missing or not supposed to be anyway now goldie had been in daytona since 1973 you know how sometimes um kids have really bad allergies or really bad asthma when they're living up north and so they have to move down south to be in a better condition for their health that's what happened with goldie and her oldest son he had really bad asthma so she moved him down to daytona but i don't really like understand how that works y'all are so smart somebody i know somebody in the comments knows somebody explained to me in the comments like how that health is like is it an altitude thing i don't know somebody tell me but she moves down to florida because her oldest son has really bad asthma at the time of her disappearance miss goldie was living alone in the twin oaks mobile home park um she had gotten she had just gotten a cell phone but she had lost it and so it was cut off once she found it again the service was cut back on so she could use her phone again she also had a neighbor by the name of kimberly smith who was a registered nurse that looked out for goldie a lot make sure she had groceries if there was anything goldie needed help doing kimberly smith will come around 
And that was really helpful to Goldie and Goldie's youngest son, Fred, who got her the cell phone. I actually really liked that too because he lived all the way in Baltimore. I say all that to say, even up in age, with a little bit of help, Goldie was extremely independent. But remember I said she lost her cell phone? Okay, this is where we get into like the true criminess of it all and how she ended up as a missing person. So after Fred cut off her cell phone, because she had lost it when she got it back. She was very upset that he had cut her phone off and she thought, she kind of took it in a bad way and thought that he was being like malicious when really Fred just didn't want anybody to use it if she had misplaced it somewhere public. He didn't want anybody picking up her cell phone and using it, you know? But I've had my phone stolen before. I was in high school, which, why were kids stealing people's phones in high school? Anyway, so I had my phone stolen out of my backpack at high school and whoever stole it literally answered it and was like, yeah, this phone is stolen. Don't ever call it again. And I never saw my phone again, so yeah. <laughs> but because of the whole cell phone debacle, Goldie was very like headstrong, very stubborn. She stopped talking to Fred all together, which in the beginning wasn't abnormal for Fred. He knew his mother's attitude and how she was. But eventually time went on and he still hadn't heard from his mom, but he was still calling her cell phone. But one day he got a package in the mail from his mom and it was her cell phone. And in the package with the cell phone was a note that basically said, stop calling. Okay, and so once he got the phone back, obviously this is his mom, so he's still gonna call. So he starts calling her home phone, but he still is not getting any sort of answer from his mom. And remember, he's all the way in Baltimore. So what he does, he calls up a friend that's local to Florida, and he says, hey, can you go pass by my mom's house? I haven't seen her in a while. I haven't heard from her in a minute. I haven't been able to make my way down there, but I'm worried, I'm concerned. Can you please go by, by my mother's house? And his friend obliges. He goes by Goldie's house, and he says he can tell from the outside that Something is just weird, something is off. Um, the outside isn't kept up the way Goldie normally takes care of her front lawn. So once Fred hears this, it makes him extremely concerned. He drops everything, he packs up so he can go to Daytona Beach. He doesn't catch a flight, he drives through the night and he gets there early morning, August 22nd, and he sees the outside of his mom's home and he knows something is wrong. She's very particular about her landscaping and there's weeds everywhere, things are unkept, he knows something is wrong. So he has a key to Goldie's home, but when he tries to put his key, and the door, it does not work. The locks have been changed. Yeah, mm -hmm. And his mother's car is also gone. The car that we found in the beginning, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he immediately calls 911 and he wants a welfare check done. He wants police to be able to go in because he is concerned that his mother's in the house, you know? So police tell him, you know, you need to stay here. You can't go in with us, but wait. They let themselves in and they look around, but there's no signs of Goldie. And so Fred is let into the home and Fred is confused because his mother's belongings, her prized possessions, things she would need, um, the clothes in her closet, everything is gone. And not only is all of Goldie's stuff gone, but there's stuff in the house that he doesn't recognize to belong to his mother. So obviously detectives go out to talk to a neighbor to get an idea of like, hey baby, Hey. To get an idea of what is going on, if they had seen anything, and neighbors have a lot to say. Neighbors tell detectives that Goldie met a man named Rusty, and Rusty was a millionaire, okay? And that him, and that Goldie and Rusty went off, got married, and that they were traveling the world on their honeymoon, because again, Rusty was a millionaire. And while neighbors seem thoroughly convinced that this is what happened, detectives and Goldie's son aren't really buying this because why would the whole neighborhood, the whole trailer park know that Goldie went off and met a man and got married, but her family wouldn't know. It's very weird. They also don't have any marriage license, any kind of record anywhere that Goldie had gotten married. So as far as the police were concerned, Goldie was very much a missing person. So in the meantime, Fred ain't playing no games about his mama. He goes on TV. He's <clears throat> he's doing interviews with the local news. Anybody that wants to listen to him talk about his mama and put her face on the news, Fred is there. A big billboard also goes up for Goldie. But in the meantime, um, detectives know that they wanna talk to Kimberly Smith 
Fred tells them about Kimberly and how she spent a lot of time with Goldie. So she would be the person who would have the most information, right? They go to Kimberly Smith's trailer. They can't get her. She's never home. They knock a few more times. She's not home. Then they realize that Kimberly Smith is incarcerated. Yeah. Yeah, this is, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where this is going. All right. And you're going to be pissed at the end of this video too. Sorry. She was on parole for writing bad checks. And she violated that probation, so that's why she was in jail now. Okay, so we're about to loop back around to the beginning where we find the car, okay? So follow me, follow me. So they finally get a hold of Kimberly in the jailhouse, okay? And when they talk to Kimberly, she gives the same story that all the neighbors had given, that Goldie was in love. She ran away with Rusty. She signed her trailer over and just went on about her business with her new man. And Kimberly said that she believed that to be the case, but if there was anything suspicious going on, that they should talk to a woman named Elaine, okay? Now, Elaine was a longtime roommate of Goldie, a friend of hers that moved in with her, and they lived together for a couple of years. But Kimberly says right around the time that Goldie up and left, her and Elaine had actually gotten into a really big fight over life insurance. Kimberly said that Elaine took out a life insurance policy on Goldie without Goldie's permission. And when Goldie found out about the life insurance policy, she was like, Elaine, what the fuck? What is this? And so that caused a big rift and that's why Elaine had moved out. So detectives go out to talk to Elaine and she does agree that she and Goldie had a big fallout and that led to her moving out. But she said the fallout had nothing to do with life insurance. And it was a more personal matter. It kind of sounded like they were special friends, but what the fuck do I know? I don't know anything. That's just me speculating, okay? So detectives are just confused. They don't know who to believe or where to start or if Goldie is even missing in the first place. Maybe she is out living her life with her new rich husband, okay? That's also a possibility. But as they're trying to figure all this out is when we find the car, okay? So the car is actually reported by a neighbor in the trailer park. One of the neighbors sees the car driving around all slow and the people in the car looking around and they realize that it's Goldie's car so they call in to 911. And obviously police come out right away. So it's two people in the car, all right? When police make it there, they pull these people over and they're like, you know, who are you and why are you in this car? And the two men in the car say that they had bought this car from somebody in this trailer park, but when they tried to go register the car, they couldn't. So they were looking for the person that sold them the car to get their money back because obviously there was some funny business going on, okay? So detectives are like, okay, well, let's think about who sold you this car. So the man in the car says that a man by the name of Adam Smith sold him the car. But once detectives look into it a little bit, they realize that Adam Smith it's Kimberly Smith's son. They get a hold of Adam and Adam says that Goldie had left him the car as a gift before she ran off with her husband. Detectives are like, mm, this is sounding fishy. It's getting weird, all right? And detectives have no proof of this. There's no title exchange. And since the car is still in Goldie's name, detectives have the right to tow it away and process the car for evidence. And this is when the tow truck comes and puts Goldie's car up on the bed and shines its bright lights into the trees. And this is when we find the body in the trash can. Okay, are we together? Yeah. So I know what you're thinking, the body in the trash can is Goldie, but it's not. All right, it's not. So don't click off thinking you know what's going on because this case is real bad, all right? It sounds like something out of a Lifetime movie. I swear, like I, that's why I had to pick up I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, let's just get into it. <laughs> so remember I said they wait until the next morning to um, get to looking into the trash can or whatever. So Fred is made aware of like the commotion, the crime scene tape. So he comes out to the scene and he's looking around and detectives walk up to him and they are honest with him. They let him know that they've found a body and he freaks out because he thinks it's his mother. Like who else would it be? But it's not. So I got ahead of myself, but not only is the body in the trash can not Goldie, it's a man. So detectives have a missing person and now an unidentified body all in the same neighborhood. So because the body is so badly decomposed, they can't um, 
like show pictures around to help identify him. They just have to put that there's been a body found in the news in the media and a local woman watching the news calls in because she thinks the body could possibly be her father. They have to do DNA testing to confirm and it is her father. This man's name is Arthur Sheldon. He was also older. He was 68 years old and he also lived in Daytona. Mommy's almost done, okay? Okay. <laughs> so his daughter also has a very similar story to Fred. She says about a year prior, Arthur Sheldon sent her an email and said he was running, running away to get married to his nurse. That him and his nurse were going to go live happily forever and ever and never talk to the family ever again. And she hadn't seen or heard from her father, like I said, in a year. And this is sounding real familiar. All right. Arthur was also not a resident of the Twin Oaks trailer park. There's no reason for him to be anywhere up and through here. Nobody in the area recognizes him except for one person. So detectives now have to look into Arthur Sheldon and see if the cases are connected. And boy, are they. Boy, are they. Okay, so Arthur lived in a different trailer park. Not super far from Twin Oaks. But he was also up in age. I don't know if I said it before, he was 68 when he disappeared. And he also had a nurse who would stop by and spend a lot of time with him named Dawn, who was supposedly the one he ran away with, okay? As far as the email that his daughter had received said. So Arthur's daughter also lets detectives know that she's kind of worried that he had been taken advantage of by this younger nurse because he had a pretty decent amount of money, okay? Upwards of like $90,000 and his daughter felt as though maybe this nurse was taking advantage of him because he had a little bit of bread or a lot of bit of bread. So they start to look into Arthur's bank account and the money is gone. The money is dwindling, okay? There's withdrawal after withdrawal after withdrawal after withdrawal, even though he's been disappeared for almost a year, okay? So they pull ATM surveillance footage, and when they're looking at the ATM surveillance footage, Dawn is Kimberly. Yeah, mm -hmm. Kimber Kimberly's name is Kimberly Dawn Smith. With Arthur, she had been using the name Dawn, and she was taking out his money out of his account. So they decide they want to go back out to talk to Kimberly. They go to her home. Y'all, when they get to Kimberly's house, they let themselves in. <laughs> and to their shock and dismay, literally this sounds like something out of a Lifetime movie. Rusty, the millionaire that apparently Goldie was supposed to run off with, the man in the picture from the wedding announcement, is sitting on the couch in Kimberly's home. So they start questioning Rusty, um, sir, what is going on? What? Are you, are you Goldie's husband? Do you know where she is? Do you, what's happening? And so Rusty says that he really doesn't know anything about that. He said he knew Goldie in passing, um, but that's pretty much it. He said he would spend time from time to time at Kimberly's house because Kimberly was also his caretaker and that she had taken some pictures of him like a while ago, but he didn't think anything of it, but he was not a part of no marriage ruse, anything. He was very clueless, okay? Aside from being the man in the picture, he ain't know nothing. So the detectives are like, what is going on? So they know they need to talk to Kimberly and deep dive into her record and see what she got going on because it's giving murderer. It's giving serial killer. It's giving killing all people and taking their money. And they found out Kimberly was a liar, a scammer. Okay, giving Joanne the scammer a run for her money. She had multiple charges for writing bad checks, multiple fraud charges, multiple aliases, in and out of prison for fraud. She was a scheming scammer, all right? And she also was not a nurse. She lied about that too. Not even a CNA, at least. So this is where things really get annoying. So they go back out to talk to Kimberly. Kimberly wandered up back in jail for violating her probation again, but she sticks to the same story that Goldie and Rusty were together and that Rusty must be lying. But it's really getting fishy and this is how I could not be no detective because I would have been so mad. I would have been body slamming everybody. In the meantime, okay, remember Goldie had signed her trailer over. She had ended up actually signed the trailer over to Kimberly, supposedly. That was probably forged too. But Kimberly's son, Adam Smith, moved into the trailer, into Goldie's trailer with his girlfriend and their kids. So they moved into this missing woman's house. 
there's just absolutely there's no way i wouldn't have walked into their house and body slammed everybody because why are y'all playing games where's this old lady mm -mm. no mm -mm. so in the meantime they need more evidence and they really need to look for goldie they're starting to think that goldie is probably not alive so what they decide to do is search the wooded area where the body was found in the trash can with cadaver dogs to see if they can find any more remains and the cadaver dogs do alert to one area they dig up this area and there is another body found buried in trash bags and this body is not in as bad of shape as arthur sheldon they're able to live they're able to get fingerprints from the body and they unfortunately match these fingerprints to Goldie. And this is where this case gets extremely frustrating and it makes me want to scream, okay? All right, let's talk about it. So because the bodies had been out in the Daytona heat for so long, they were so badly decomposed that they could not come up with a positive cause of death for either body. And without a positive cause of death they are unable to charge Kimberly with any type of murder manslaughter anything she faces no murder charges at all ever all right okay even though we know these bodies didn't just bury themselves and that Kimberly is probably very much involved if you can't prove it you can't prosecute detectives settle with charging Kimberly on numerous different fraud charges because she was taking money from Goldie as well. And they offer her a plea and she takes a 15 year plea for the fraud charges. And she'll actually be up for parole sometime this year. Are you frustrated? Me too. Kimberly's son and her boyfriend plead no contest to some accessory charges because obviously they were benefiting from the fraud, living in Goldie's house and um, driving her car. They were also caught getting money out of Goldie's account. And they, and they were sentenced to three years a pop, but they probably didn't even serve anything close to that. And that's where this case leaves off. Mm. <sighs> yeah, that's a wrap. I'm frustrated. I know you're frustrated. Um, yeah. I don't know what to say. I want to punch a hole in the wall. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt the case with it, but obviously I had to take a break from filming. It's actually a couple of days later because I got interrupted, but I could not like scrap this whole case. I had to share the frustration with you guys. Um, and this will be the last upload of the week. Thank you guys for hanging out with me all week, Monday through Friday. I will be back. Why are you yelling? Real quick, before we wrap it up, I have another true crime TikTok. Y'all, I cannot believe I hadn't heard of this until I saw it on TikTok. Like, I have not seen it on the news at all whatsoever. If you've been following, you know, last Wednesday, Lindsay was charged with murdering her three children and mistreatment for postpartum psychosis. Yesterday, she appeared in court from her hospital bed on Zoom with her attorney confirming that she suffered a spinal cord injury and is paralyzed from the waist down. We now know that on January 24th, Patrick Clancy came home from running errands to a completely silent house. He found blood in an open window in the couple's upstairs bedroom and then his wife lying in the lawn with lacerations to her neck. When he asked where the kids were, she told him they were in the basement. Operators in the 911 call can reportedly vividly remember the moment that he ran downstairs calling for them. They still had exercise ropes around their necks and he began screaming louder and louder, begging for them to breathe. Lindsay has told a psychologist that in the moments before, she'd heard Amian's voice telling her that it was her last chance to kill the kids. Over the weekend, her attorney revealed that they planned to argue she lacks criminal responsibility in the case because she was over-medicated and involuntarily intoxicated. Her attorney also confirms that Lindsay was unbelievably prescribed a total of 12 medications for mood disorders, anxiety, and psychosis. I'm going to list them up above, but you guys are probably familiar with at least some of them. We also know that on Friday, Lindsay was successfully granted a forensic psychiatric evaluation. With this, her team hopes to, quote, convince the judge that her medical status is dire enough that she should be awaiting trial somewhere more humane, possibly at her parents' house with GPS monitoring. So again, today, Lindsay remains hospitalized after attempting to take her own life. She appeared to wipe away tears yesterday as a judge declined to set a cash bail amount, but agreed to allow her to stay in the hospital pending transfer to a rehab facility. After four days, Patrick Clancy has publicly forgiven his wife for killing their three kids. 
For the past few months, Patrick has been working from his family's home in Duxbury so that he could support Lindsay as she underwent intensive treatment for postpartum depression. Around 6 p.m. on January 24th, he left the house for just 25 minutes to pick up takeout for the family. When he got back, he found Lindsay had jumped from their second story window. He actually called 911 to report that, but inside things were much worse. All three kids had been strangled and tragically, five-year-old Cora and three-year-old Dawson were pronounced deceased at the hospital shortly after. Seven-month-old Callan initially survived, but then he too tragically passed away at the hospital on Friday afternoon. On Saturday, Patrick released this huge statement on his GoFundMe, which has now raised almost a million dollars. In it, he really just talks about how much pride he had in being Lindsay's husband and a father to their children. He mentions her overwhelming mental illness and asks that we all forgive her as he already has. It's also important to know that before all of this, Lindsay was a great labor and delivery nurse at Massachusetts General Hospital. She was placed on leave for mental health issues, and Patrick says that the real Lindsay is who you see here, generously loving and caring. Likely none of us knew Lindsay, but we do know she was getting help and that symptoms of this can include complete depersonalization and thoughts of wanting to harm yourself or your baby. On Wednesday, she was officially charged with three counts of strangulation and two counts of homicide, but obviously Callan has since passed away as well. The link to this GoFundMe will be in my bio, as well as this resource. I have genuinely not been able to stop thinking about the Lindsay Clancy case since it hit the media a few days ago, and I want to share some facts of the case, not just speculation, but facts, and I do want to follow up with some of my thoughts. So here's what we know. Lindsay Clancy was a labor and delivery nurse. Lindsay Clancy was never formally diagnosed with postpartum depression or postpartum psychosis. She was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. This does not mean that she was not suffering from either of those. Lindsay was involved in an intensive outpatient therapy five days a week and was working closely with her doctors to find a medication combination that worked for her. Lindsay never brought up postpartum psychosis to her husband and never shared any sentiments that she was losing touch with reality, having delusions, or hearing voices. A few months before Lindsay unalived her children, she had documented in her journal that she was feeling a lot of resentment towards her older two children because they took up so much of her time she could not give her youngest baby the attention that she wanted. Just before unaliving her children, Lindsay had just come home from a five-day stay in an inpatient psychiatric facility. This indicates to me that she was clearly struggling mentally and either felt like she was a danger to herself or her children, but I could be wrong. The morning of the unalivings, Lindsay took one of her children into the pediatrician's office and the nurses and doctors all report that there was no sort of incident or indication that something was wrong. According to prosecution, Lindsay did not take advantage of the opportunity to unalive her children because her husband was out of the house, but she sent her husband out of the house and looked at Google Maps to see how long he would be gone, to see how much time she had alone with the children. This is why the prosecution thinks that this was premeditated. Lindsay used exercise bands to cut off the air supply of all three of her children one by one. It would have taken a good deal of force as well as several minutes of applying pressure to these exercise bands for someone to pass away, a good three to seven minutes. While Lindsay was in the middle of unaliving her children, her husband called her and they were able to have a normal coherent conversation. And according to him, she was clearly based in reality, but he did say it sounded as though she was in the middle of something. After unaliving her children, she attempted to unalive herself, but this was not successful. A few days later, Lindsay woke up in the hospital, partially now paralyzed, and the first thing that she asked was if she needed an attorney, which is very odd to me because if Lindsay was now back in reality and realized what had happened, why would she not ask about her husband or her children? Lindsay told her husband that she did this because she heard a man's voice in her head telling her to unalive her children. She also said she had never heard any voices in her head before this. She states it was a brief moment of psychosis. And everybody's talking about her mental health and postpartum depression in the comments, which definitely is a thing, but lots of women suffer from postpartum depression. I feel like most women do way more than it's talked about, but majority of those women do not go on a rampage and kill all three of their kids okay no matter the state of her mental health she very much needs to go to prison all right i'm trying to debate on whether or not i should get a fresh cup of coffee now before we start filming yeah yeah okay guys let's hop into 
today's case. For today's case, we're in Philadelphia. I don't think we've done a case in Philadelphia, in a, at least in a very long time. I know we've been outside of Philadelphia. It is January of 1993 in Philadelphia. Like the dead of winter, it is so cold. I truly could not even imagine living in a northern state. Like I've definitely never experienced real cold and I'm okay with that. I don't, I don't want to freeze. The furthest north I've ever been is um, Chicago for like a layover. And I was obviously like safe and comfortable in the warmth of the airport. But I just remember I kept thinking like, if I have to go outside, like if I had to go outside of this airport for anything, I would freeze. <laughs> Because I was flying from New Orleans to Chicago to California. Why the fuck I had to go all the way up to Chicago to get to California? I don't know. But that's <laughs> what happened. So I was underdressed to say the least. But luckily I didn't have to leave the airport. Today's case centers around 17 year old Shelly Turner. Her name is spelled S-H-I-L-I-E. I've heard some people pronounce it Shelly. And then I've heard some people say Shelly, and then I've heard some people kind of sound somewhere in between. Shelly went to William Penn High School, and she was the school's like breakout track star. She was great, she was fast, she was charismatic. Not only was she really good at running track, but she was like the light of the team. Shelly being the best one on the team was no small feat. Because William Penn was said to have the best track program in the state. So Shelly was literally the best of the best. And Shelly was an all-star getting ready to move on to college. She had scholarship after scholarship after scholarship. Everybody wanted her to come run track for them. Not only was she busy and responsibility laden at school, she was also pretty busy at home. It was she, her mother, her little sister, and her stepfather. And because her stepfather and mother worked a lot, Shelly was oftentimes um, responsible for getting her sister up and ready for school, getting her on the school bus, making sure she ate breakfast as well as dinners, making sure she did her homework. So January 13th, 1993 is the date of a very big track meet for Shelly. This is like the home stretch of her high school career. She's got scouts to impress. She's showing up to every track meet at her absolute best. But when it comes time for this track meet, Shelly is nowhere to be found, which is immediately alarming to everyone involved because she would never miss a track meet, let alone with the no word. So her coaches and fellow teammates were very concerned and they reach out to her mother, Vivian, right away. <clears throat> when they get in touch with Vivian, Vivian's surprised that Shelly isn't there as well. She said she hadn't seen Shelly since the day before. She was supposed to stay with her friend, Andrea, which is such a beautiful name. I have a cousin who passed whose name was Andrea. But Andrea stayed literally directly across the street from Shelly and her family. But Vivian and her husband, Clarence, Shelly's stepfather were very alarmed that she was missing this track meet. So they called police immediately to report her missing. Police come out <clears throat> and they talk to Vivian and Clarence and Vivian tells them that Shelly said she was gonna be staying at a friend's house after attending a school dance. And that's where she had thought she was. So the first person they wanna go talk to is right across the street to Shelly's friend, Andrea. And Andrea, she does have to come clean. She has a secret. She said that she and Shelly had definitely never really planned to go to this school dance together. That Shelly was using this as a cover to go to her boyfriend's house. Her boyfriend's name is Sean. And they had just recently started dating. Andrea said that Shelly had came over. And she said Shelly was wearing an outfit that didn't really match. So... She helped Shelly out a little bit and she gave her a leather jacket that better matched her outfit that belonged to Andrea's father. Shelly threw that on and she left and that was the last time Andrea had seen her friend. Before heading out, Andrea said that Shelly promised her she would be back soon, that she wouldn't stay out too late because she had the big important track meet the next day that she was not willing to miss. 
or jeopardized in any way for that matter. So of course, their next person they want to talk to is Sean. Like I said, Sean Williams and Shelly, they had really just met. Sean had recently switched over to William Penn High School. He and Shelly had instantly connected and he admits that she had came over to his house that night and they were just hanging out, having a good time. And that eventually they lost track of time. So they kind of got up to leave in a rush because it was so late. It was about 1.30 in the morning. I don't know if I said that already. She decided to just take the first bus she saw. They didn't want to be standing out in the cold for too long in the middle of the night. And Sean said he watched her get on the bus. He said he got, he said she got onto bus number 15. And that was it. That was the last he had seen her. He was very adamant that, you know, she left that night and he hadn't seen her again after that. And police very much believed him. There was really no motive for any type of foul play or anything like that to happen when it came to Sean because like I said, they had just recently met. He really liked her, she really liked him. There was no conflict, no tension. You know, they just liked each other, they hit it off. It was fresh puppy love. They didn't have time to argue. <laughs> so they talked to the bus driver who was driving bus 15 that night and he says that he did pick up Shelly when she was with Sean, he remembered Sean. Shelly got on the bus by herself and the bus driver said she got off the bus about six blocks away from her home and that when Shelly got off the bus, she was fine. It was the middle of the night, so she wasn't talking to anybody on the bus. She didn't meet anybody on the bus. There wasn't any type of conflict or you know any kind of anything that happened on the bus that was abnormal. When she got off the bus, she was just fine. So detectives start to wonder if something happened to Shelly on her walk home. There was a lot of abandoned houses on her walk home and it wasn't uncommon during this time for people to be snatched up by people laying awake in these abandoned homes. Like women would be sexually assaulted in these abandoned homes. So they decide to search the abandoned homes that Shelly would have passed on her walk home, but they don't come up with anything nothing unusual is found inside of these homes at this point everybody is looking for Shelly her mom Vivian is doing as much press as she possibly can she's doing the news she's doing radio shows to get Shelly's name out everywhere and the public really rallies behind Vivian when Shelly went missing she became everybody's daughter and everybody wanted to help find her but there's really no leads on Shelly's whereabouts. There's even a reward, but nobody has any idea where Shelly could be. So at this point, we're coming up on two weeks after Shelly's disappearance and they don't, <clears throat> excuse me, they don't have any leads. So detectives try to take like a no stone left unturned type of approach. And so they ask her mom, Vivian, if there was anybody in her life that she felt like weary about anybody that could have done anything to Shelly or anyone who she thought might be suspicious anybody that made her uncomfortable and Vivian points the finger at coach Hickey Shelly's male track coach she said they spent a lot of time together and it maybe made her a little uncomfortable so they go out to talk to coach Hickey but Coach Hickey is understanding and he cooperates very well with detectives. He tells them that he was not involved. He also has an alibi. He was out and about on the town the night of Shelly's disappearance. Multiple people could alibi him. He was in no way, shape, or form involved in her disappearance. But what Coach Hickey does do is point the finger right back at Shelly's mom. Mm-hmm, yeah. He said he didn't like the way Shelly talked about her home life. It was very stressful and toxic from what he could tell from the way Shelly talked about her mom. He said at first he didn't think about Shelly's complaining too much because it's a high school. What high school teenagers aren't complaining about their parents being overbearing, overwhelming, too strict, you know, that's very common for high school teachers and coaches for, to hear. 
but he said that definitely sometimes the things that Shelly would say, they were extra. They were more serious, more concerning than the average everyday teenager complaining about things at home. And that he did look out for Shelly and keep a closer eye on her because he did not want her home life to affect how she performed on the track and mess up you know any of her scholarship opportunities because more than anything he took a lot of time out with his track stars his track girls and boys so they would have an opportunity to go to college so detectives know what mr hickey is saying about her home life but they don't have any other evidence of Shelly having a troubled home life. Nobody else has mentioned this. So they don't go too hard, you know, with this information. However, they start to take this little information more seriously when Andrea comes to the police with more information. Remember, Andrea lives right across the street and she's very alarmed and concerned because she said that she saw Clarence, Shelly's stepfather, leaving the home one morning in the same leather jacket that she had given Shelly the night of her disappearance. And detectives don't take this lightly. So they bring Clarence in for questioning, to question him about the leather jacket. And he's confused and taken aback, but he insists that he doesn't know anything about Shelly's disappearance. He said maybe the jackets are just similar and maybe it was all just one misunderstanding, a big coincidence, but we all know there's not a lot of room for coincidence when it comes to true crime. But ultimately, Clarence is ruled out as a suspect because his work schedule, he works overnight delivering newspapers, and his work schedule would not have allotted him the time to be involved in Shilly's disappearance, so he is ruled out as well. So feeling like the case was going nowhere, things started to stall. Missing person detectives decided to bring in a psychic and Vivian agrees. So the psychic comes into the home. She's looking around, feeling things out, scoping out the energy. And she goes to Shelly's room and lays down in Shelly's bed. They have a little bit of a moment where the psychic like jumps up out of the bed and grabs Vivian's arm and she says that Shelly is somewhere cold which is Philadelphia in the dead of winter where would not be cold but that's what the psychic says but this freaks Vivian out she asks the psychic to leave and this obviously just leads nowhere and weeks pass with no lead and so a body is found in Fairmont Park four weeks after Shelly's disappearance. So February 20th, 1993, they're having a march to keep Shelly's name out there, like rally the community around her again. And it's wildly enough, just a few hours after this march, that a man walking his dog around Fremont Park stumbles across the body. The body is underneath a tarp and then on top of the tarp there's like a piece of like a laminate holding the tarp down. And he walks up, he gets a little closer and he realizes that there's extremities, a hand, body parts underneath this tarp. And so he immediately calls 911. So once the body's uncovered, um, the body has several gunshot wounds to the upper chest and head as well as like defensive gunshot wounds to the hands and so the body's taken into the medical examiner's office and vivian is brought in to identify the body as her daughter shelly turner and it was absolutely devastating because most people thought that they would find shelly alive so this is obviously no longer a missing persons investigation it's now a homicide investigation. So the police department is switching gears. The case is transferred to homicide and Shelly's family prepares for her funeral. And her funeral is jam-packed. 
people from other track programs across the county came out other track coaches all of her teammates from william penn and there were a lot of eyes at this funeral and we always say in cases like this like you know there's not one way to grieve and if somebody's acting weird at a funeral that does not necessarily make them guilty but it does but it is noticed by plenty of people at the funeral that vivian isn't the grieving mother you'd think she would be in this circumstance she's lively she's greeting people as they walk into the church she's waving and smiling and it's just a little odd and people take notice her behavior at the funeral was odd enough for the rumor mill to start swirling people started making whispers maybe she was involved the community started to distrust and turn on Vivian. These little whispers turned into people in the media and the news thinking that maybe Vivian was involved. And because all of these rumors started swirling, Vivian decided to go onto a local radio show. She went on the Mary Mason show to defend herself and to exclaim that she had nothing to do with her daughter's passing. So on the Mary Mason show, she's exclaiming that she's innocent and she's also asking the public for more help. If anybody knows anything to please come forward, the whole spiel. And she's pretty convincing, but she and Mary Mason, the host of the show, obviously, have a conversation after the mics are turned off. And this conversation rubs Mary so wrong, she decides to go to detectives after the interview. Mary Mason tells detectives that after the interview, after the mics had turned off, she, she said that Vivian started to go into detail about how she thought Shelly probably looked after and during the attack. She said that Shelly's teeth were glistening in the moonlight and that Shelly's hands were over her head when she got shot. And she said the things that Vivian were saying were too specific and too detailed to be hypothetical. And with detective suspicions of someone in the household already being involved, they decide that they need to go out and talk to Vivian, but Vivian beats them to it. She comes up to the police station complaining about the news and the media not leaving her alone. And this plays out in the detective's favor because they just play along and Vivian wants to know what she can do to deter the media. What, like, what we gotta do to make this stop? And detectives say, well, okay, you can take a lie detector test. And Vivian agrees. So she takes the polygraph test and she fails miserably after being questioned by the polygraph administrator for hours. She just fails, flunks, fails. Deception was detected. And once she realizes she failed the polygraph test, she breaks down. So she says that on the night in question, when Shelly came home, she did in fact make it all the way home. Vivian said she was up drinking that night. And when Shelly got home, they got into an argument about her getting home so late. She said that because she was drunk, that there was even a small altercation between she and Shelly. And that she went to go grab a gun from under her mattress, unbeknownst to Shelly. She told Shelly to get in the car, that she was done taking care of her, and that she was gonna drop Shelly off at the police department and leave her there. So they get in the car, but instead of going to the police department, they pass the police department up and they drive out to Fremont Park. Vivian then says that they get out of the car and she tells Shelly, like, if you want to fight me, then let's fight. Let's brawl it out right here in this park, out in the open, and that's what we'll do. But instead of fighting, Vivian first hits Shelly with the butt of the gun knocking her down knocking her out and then she stood over her and shot her six times she said that the tarp and the piece of laminate were already out there but i don't know if i believe that i don't know so with her confession they're able to charge her with the murder once this gets out in the media the public is pissed because vivian was leading marches speaking to the public like she was a grieving mother whole time she was the murderer and people had been helping her rallying with her, grieving with her, and she was deceiving everyone. 
the community was shocked especially at the brutality of the murder for a mother to shoot her daughter while she was already down on the ground six times was absolutely insane to the public so the next day they execute a search warrant on the home and they also talk to Clarence again. They pretty much rule him out again because they want to double back and make sure he had nothing to do with this. But he is adamant that he didn't and they rule him out as to having any type of involvement. They also want to find their murder weapon and this leather jacket, but neither are ever recovered. There's also no fingerprints, no DNA linking Vivian to Shelly's murder, no witnesses. The only thing that the prosecution can rely on is Vivian's confession. And then three days later, I think once Vivian and her defense realized that there was no physical evidence tying her to the case, she decided to take back her confession. She recants her confession. She said that it was coerced, that she had been interrogated for hours and hours and hours, and that she and that she confessed to the murder under the pressure of the detectives. The case goes to trial. First, the judge has to decide whether or not they're going to allow her confession to even be admitted into the courtroom. The judge does allow it. And so because of this, the defense feels like the only way for them to counter this confession is for Vivian to take the stand. Her testimony was very all over the place, inconsistent. She perjured herself a few times. It wasn't adding up, but she exclaimed to the jury how intoxicated she was on the night of the murder. Even though the murder seemed pretty much planned out, she had to go get the gun from under her mattress, drive to the park, cover the body, then go back home and she did all this intoxicated, whatever. But it plays an important part of her sentencing. While she would have originally been convicted of first degree murder, the involvement of the alcohol because she was under the influence drops it to a third degree murder charge. And while found guilty, Vivian is only sentenced to 10 to 20 years for the murder of her daughter, which I just find so hard to believe. After shooting her six times, 10 to 20 years. And altogether, Vivian only served 11 years in prison for the murder of her daughter, which is so crazy. Lord have mercy. Like how is that even possible? I don't know. And that is where we leave off with today's Hey, is that not insane? It's so unfair and her future was so promising. It just fucking sucks. I think her mom definitely had to be just jealous. And this one little blow up over her coming in, coming in late that is not what led to this in because I forgot to mention that the jealousy theory was also fed by the fact that Vivian also ran track in high school. It said that she wasn't as good as Shilly, but she was very jealous of her career, going to college, and like even possibilities of Shilly going to the Olympics, and that she never even attended one of Shilly's track meets. I don't know how true that is, but I heard that, I read that. And before we close out today's video, I also wanted to show you guys another true crime TikTok. This one is more lighthearted and funny. It's really just funny, and it pertains to the murder murders. And I also wanted to remind you guys to leave your thoughts, comments, and opinions about the murder murders in the comments so you can be a part of the murder murders discussion video okay Mwah. bye hey dad yeah i'm at the cabo place they gave you life that's fucked you were capping though so hard is the money still buried in the backyard fuck yes i got out of that fucking country are they investigating me hell no dad and did you see that documentary they were saying the weirdest shit about me i did not do that are you kidding fuck find a way to send me the money and i'll, I'll talk to you soon okay all right, bye. All right, guys, so for today's case, we are in Richmond, Virginia. The top of the year, January 1st, 2006. New Year's Day at around 2 p.m. that afternoon, a 911 call comes in reporting a house fire. 
So firemen, police officers, and ambulances, they all respond to the house fire on West 31st Street. And the house is a smoky, fiery mess, okay? So firemen make their way into this fire and they pull two people out to begin with, but you know, the house is on fire, there's smoke, they can't really see. When they pull the two victims out of the fire, they realize that this is a whole lot more than just a regular house fire. The two victims are both women, one older and then one a smaller child, but they're both duct taped around their face and their feet are bound as well so this is some sort of crime scene so everything stops they know that there are other people inside the home but they can no longer disturb this crime scene it's no longer a recovery they have to get the fire out and have crime scene technicians come in so where originally they thought this was just a house fire it's obviously now a fire that was probably started to cover up whatever had happened in this home all of the bodies were found in the basement of the home and it seems as though this is where the fire started so it takes about two hours for the fire department to put the fire out and make sure the house was structurally safe enough for medical examiners and detectives to get in so once they enter the home they find two more bodies in the basement one of another little girl and then an adult male. The adult male was found differently than the women in the home. He was hogtied, so bound at the wrist and the ankles with an extension cord, while the girls had all been duct taped around the face. So something absolutely brutal had happened inside of this home. In the basement, they also find two hammers that are placed side by side. So they assume that these hammers were what was used to cause the blood force trauma. And they wonder since there are two hammers, were there two assailants? And aside from the fire, the home didn't seem to be all that disturbed, if that makes sense. So the fire burned in the basement area. So smoke had traveled upstairs, soot had traveled upstairs. So there's a layer of smoke and soot upstairs, but not a lot of burns, if that makes sense. And um, there's toys on the floor. There's a cup of coffee on the table. The stove was still on because someone was in the middle of cooking. There's vegetables being cut up by the stove, like the house was in normal fashion. And it seemed as though this family was interrupted in the middle of a normal day. The only thing that's kind of out of place for detectives is that, remember how I said there was a lot of soot, a lot of smoke had traveled up to the upper layer levels of the house. So there was soot on the counter, but there was a ring where soot was not present. Like the house had been burning for a while and whoever had done this had come back upstairs to the kitchen and removed something from the counter before they left. The home was not ransacked. There was money that was left out and they can't see where anything is missing. And unfortunately, because of the fire element, a lot of their forensic evidence would be washed away or compromised. So the victims inside of the home are Brian Harvey and his wife, Catherine, and their two daughters. Ruby and Stella Harvey. Stella, the oldest, is the daughter who was found with her father. Ruby, the youngest, was brought out with her mother. And because this whole process takes hours, by the time police get around to IDing the victims, family and friends have already gathered outside of caution tape. And they put two and two together. They know that something horrible has happened to their family before even being approached by detectives. And I was telling you guys, family was at the scene. So there's one friend of the family at the scene who brought off the bat once to talk to detectives because she had said she had been at the home just a few hours before the fire at around 10 a.m. She was actually dropping Stella off after a sleepover and she said that Catherine was extremely weird when she answered the door. She says that Stella ran down to the basement because that's where the kids play and she says that her daughter, who Stella had had the sleepover with, tried to run behind Stella but Catherine grabbed her and pushed her back outside and told them they needed to leave. She told them she wasn't feeling well. She kind of pushed them out of the door, hurried them off. And obviously this person, this friend of the family thought it was extremely weird, but she, she left. 
So they're thinking whatever had happened was already taking place at around 10 a.m. when Stella was dropped back off at home. So detectives continue to question friends and family. The first person who sticks out to detectives is a man by the name of Johnny Hot. Johnny said he was headed to the home because they were having a chili cook-off that they were gonna be preparing for and he was coming to help. He says when he got there, the house was on fire. He walked through the front door. He couldn't find the family. He went upstairs, he couldn't find the family. He went down to where the basement door was, but when he opened the basement door, it was too smoky. He knew he couldn't go in, but he was trying to save the family. And as they question Johnny, they realize that he doesn't really have a good grasp of like what actually was going on inside of the home like um detectives knew that the stove was still on it was a gas stove so there was like flames coming up from the stove you could see that the stove was on if you were in the home but johnny didn't recall seeing the stove on and so johnny goes on to the news telling the news he went in trying to save the family like he's really paying himself to be a hero but detectives are confused because every time he's coming in to give a statement to detectives it's not the same statement so right off the bat they feel like johnny is lying but they don't know if he's lying just trying to make himself look good after this tragic thing had happened to his best friend or if he was in some way involved but it ain't right some in the water ain't clean so they continue to question him so he keeps changing up his story, but he's denying the fact that he's lying. So detectives ask him to take a polygraph test. So right off the bat, they ask him if he went into the house on the polygraph test and he says yes. The lie detector test determined that that was a lie. So he was just on the news going around telling people that he went into this house as a hero. Just for sympathy. After his best friend and his entire family had been murdered. be so fucking for real but he was the one to come to the house and find it on fire and report the smoke to 911 but he did not go in he was not about that life he did not go in trying to help nothing or do nothing but when it came down to like the nitty-gritty of actually being involved in the murder he passed all those questions and so they're able to rule him out as the initial suspect and realized you know that they wasted a lot of time questioning him because he wouldn't keep his ass out of the media trying to paint himself as a hero as hercules after your friend and their entire family was murdered lying is crazy and after they got johnny up on and out the way off their suspect list unfortunately after this the suspect list is empty they have no idea who could be responsible but they figure it's more than one person because of how the bodies were found and because they found the two hammers two weapons there was also like i said stab wounds to the neck and each member of the family kind of passed away in different manners the mother catherine had a fatal stab wound stella suffer from carbon monoxide poisoning like it was a lot going on it was a lot it was a lot it was a lot and this obviously happened over the course of some time and they didn't have a who what when where why nothing nowhere to turn no suspect list friends and family said they didn't have any enemies no one who would want to do this to them and like i said nothing in the home was taken but what detectives do realize from friends and family is that Catherine wore a very specific wedding ring that her husband had custom made for her it was very exquisite it was very specific and tailored to Catherine. it wasn't just like your regular run of the mill wedding ring and that wedding ring as well as a necklace that she often wore were not found in the home anywhere and obviously they also weren't found on the body so at the very least whoever had done this had made off with Catherine's wedding ring and unfortunately the case would stall for about a week with no other leads and it would take another home invasion and the murders of another whole entire family for detectives to have any kind of lead in the Harvey family murder. So a week after the Harvey family slayings, police are made aware of another possible situation by a friend. 
this woman's name is Latoya Pauly, and she was calling to have a welfare check done on her friend Ashley Baskerville because she believed Ashley was in some sort of danger. Ashley lived with her family in Chesterfield, Virginia, which is about 30 minutes outside of Richmond. So when police arrive to Ashley Baskerville's family home, they knock on the door, there's no response. So eventually they decide to enter on their own. Upon entering the home in the living room, they find one body of an older black male. This man was found with plastic wrap and duct tape over his face and they could also tell that there was something in his mouth, some type of clothing, maybe socks. He was also bound at the wrist and the ankles. And in the rest of the home, in two separate bedrooms, they find two female victims, both black females, and they're found the same way, plastic wrapped, duct, duct taped around the face, arms, wrist bound, ankles bound, both obviously deceased. So the people in the home are Ashley Baskerville. She's the daughter of Mary Baskerville Tucker, who was the other woman found inside of the home. And Perciel Tucker, Miss Mary's husband, and Ashley's stepfather is the man found in the living room. And so right off the bat, detectives think that both the cases are possibly connected Catherine Harvey was also found with a sock in her mouth underneath the layers of duct tape. So the proximity, the similarities, the fact that they're happening within a week of each other, they wanna try to find some sort of connection. And they're thinking the Baskerville Tuckers didn't have any blunt force trauma or stab wounds because the people who attacked the Harveys realized that the duct tape over the face and nose wasn't enough, enough or wasn't killing them fast enough. So they went in with the plastic wrap over the face first and then the duct tape. So after they did that, they didn't have to go back in and attack the family to kill them like they had to do at the Harvey residence. So they feel like the cases are connected. They feel like their assailants are learning and adapting and getting better at what they're doing. So they wanna be able to apprehend these suspects and nip it in the bud before another family is found deceased in their home. Families popping up deceased like it's an episode of Criminal Minds. Y'all know Criminal Minds gotta be like three victims before, before they actually you know, save the last family. That's what this is giving. And they go out to talk to the person who reported the situation at the Baskerville Tucker home. Now, this girl's name, like I said, is Latoya. And originally when she called to ask police to go out, she said that she was just worried because she hadn't been able to talk to Ashley on the phone, which mm -mm, they feel like she definitely has some more knowledge of whatever had happened in this home. So when they're talking to Latoya, they found out that Latoya and Ashley had met in jail. They were in prison together and had been friends after the fact. And she says that on January 6, 2006, she and Ashley were hanging out, but they were hanging out with two other people, Ricky and Ray, okay? And these were Ashley's friends. Ashley knew Ricky because they were pen pals while they were both incarcerated who had connected after they had both had gotten out of jail. And Ricky was Ray's uncle, but like close in age, like amigo situation, like they were uncle and nephew, but they were super close in age, y'all know. So Latoya goes on to say that they were all hanging out and they decided that they wanted to score some quick cash. And so Latoya said, as they were all hanging out, they came up with this plan of, of robbing Ashley's family under the guise of like holding Ashley hostage. So they were gonna break into the home, holding Ashley hostage, tie her up, all of the things, and get her family to give them money because Ashley said her stepfather, Percy L, had a lot of cash inside the home. So they were gonna run in, duct tape all of them, get them to give them the money. Ashley was gonna pretend to not be in on it while Ricky and Ray ran off with the cash 
and they would meet up later. Latoya said they made this plan, it was this whole big thing, but she wanted zero parts. She didn't want to be involved at all, so they went off and did whatever they did. And so Latoya says later on that day, a few hours after the fact, Ricky and Ray showed up at her house and she was like, where is Ashley? And they said, Ashley ain't with us no more. Like we got rid of her and she's very confused. She's very concerned. And this is when she decides to call 911 and ask them to go check on Ashley's home. So they're wondering if I committed this first crime together, decided to hit a second lick, but when they decided to hit the second lick, they decided to kill Ashley as well and just take her out of the picture. But of course, obviously they need to catch up to Ricky and Ray to get an idea of what happened in the house that day, if they're even willing to talk at all. At this point, they had killed four, five, six, seven people. So they probably wouldn't be the easiest people to talk to. So while interviewing Latoya, they get her to call Ray and just to see if she can get them talking about the situation again. And so she asks again, what happened to Ashley? And he says that they don't have to worry about Ashley anymore. And Latoya's like, well, why? What happened? You know, tell me more. Which if I ever commit a crime and the person who knows about the crime is on the phone telling me to tell them more, I'm hanging up because I know you with the police. You gotta be with the police. I'm not taking that chance. I just feel like, why are you talking about crimes? over the phone. At this point, we should know the last thing we doing is talking about crimes over the phone, but whatever. So as Ray goes into more detail, he says that he decided to kill Ashley because she threatened them. She said if she didn't get a big chunk of this money, she was gonna go to police and tell them what had happened with the first murder. So unbeknownst to Ashley, they had flipped on her and decided to kill her too. See, that's what I was trying to be. <laughs> so Ray stays on the phone. Ray is just a chatterbox and he tells Latoya that they're headed to Pennsylvania, which is where they're from. They've got family there. They've got um, known addresses there. And Ray also tells Latoya on the phone while she's with police that he's driving around in Perciel Tucker's car. So Richmond detectives call Pennsylvania police to let them know, hey, we're looking for this car with this license plate and it probably is around these addresses and we're looking for this car because it's at this point connected to two home invasions two families dead seven people murdered like can you please help us and so obviously pennsylvania police are like yeah we'll you know we'll get everybody out everybody's out in this area around these addresses looking for this car it was a chevy trailblazer and it was bright blue so it kind of stuck out it wasn't hard to find and eventually police do find percy L's car outside of like a residential area so once they find the car they decide to bring in swat teams because they don't know what is exactly is going on inside of this home they want to be as prepared as possible and so swat runs through the house so Ray is the first person apprehended. For whatever reason, Ray tried to run clean past the SWAT team. Maybe running past like two regular regular cops, but thinking you about to run past a whole SWAT team is crazy, but I guess you gotta try something, right? But they're able to apprehend both of them at the same time, Ricky and Ray, and they bring them in for a formal questioning so ray is ready to talk to detectives right off the bat because he's looking to make a deal and he tells them basically the same thing he had said on the phone earlier he says again that they had planned on getting rid of ashley before they even stepped foot in the house but that they took care of the mother and father first and that ashley watched the whole thing go down she didn't contest she didn't scream she didn't shake once they found out where the money was and they duct taped the family, Ashley was all good until they turned on her. Ray said they drug her into the bedroom where her mother was at and told Ashley to say goodbye to her mother. And then they drug her into a separate back bedroom and got rid of her. They tied her up, duct taped her around the mouth with a plastic wrap the same as they did everybody else. But while Ray is singing like a canary to detectives, he doesn't mention the prior Harvey 
murder. But they are obviously definitely charging them with the Baskerville Tucker murders. So detectives need something that are gonna link these two crime scenes because they're just so similar. There's no way that Ray and Ricky weren't involved with the Harvey murders, you know? And possibly even Ashley as well. And the piece of the puzzle that brings the case full circle for detectives and that connects the two crimes is that when the autopsy is finished for the Baskerville Tuckers, ugh, this makes me sick to even say, honestly, ugh. Medical examiners go to give back the jewelry that was found on, but the Baskerville family says, you know, this ring, this isn't ours. And it was a ring that Ashley Baskerville was wearing when she was murdered and it was Catherine Harvey's wedding ring. So after doing what they did to the Harveys, Ashley was walking around with Catherine's wedding ring on and she was then murdered in the same way, still wearing Catherine's wedding ring. So obviously with this piece of evidence linking both the murders, they go back to Ray and say, you know, there's no deal unless you're completely honest about the whole thing. And that's when he confesses to the Harvey murders as well. He says with the Harvey family murders, it was the same fashion. They were looking to come up on some quick money that the Harvey family was a victim just by chance. They said they rolled over to this nice neighborhood and they walked straight into the Harvey family home. The Harveys felt safe enough to just have their door wide open and unfortunately these two men walked right in and Ray said that Ashley was just their driver, the getaway driver, that she picked the location and she dropped them off and then they walked around on foot until they found the Harvey family home. He goes on to say that they led them all into the basement and they tied everybody up and separated. So one of them was down with the family in the basement while the other one was going through the house. And this is how they were able to see the family friend walking up with the two girls before she was there. So they scrambled back down to the bedroom, untied Catherine so she could answer the door and told her, you know, don't do nothing crazy or we're gonna kill everybody down here. So the whole thing was happening when the family friend returned Stella to the home. And Catherine had to open the door and act like everything was okay. Whole time child hell was breaking loose in the basement. He also admits that the family had all of these injuries because they were trying to kill them and couldn't. So they kept doing things that didn't work, doing things that didn't work. And that, you know, obviously they lit the house on fire to cover their tracks. They had to put on real clothes so I could run through carpool when we're done. But finally, what detectives learned from Ray is that the clear surface on the Harvey's kitchen countertops was a tray of cookies. And after not being able to steal much from this house, they took the tray of cookies that was sitting on the countertop and that Latoya was wearing the ring because they felt like it was too distinct for them to go pawn. So with Ray's total full confession and his deal, they don't have to do much when it comes to Ricky, which is fine, because Ricky ain't willing to talk no way. He ends up going to trial and being found guilty, 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 of course, of five counts of murder. He's sentenced to death. Obviously, Ray is spared the death penalty when it's his time because he takes the guilty plea. But he gets two life sentences, so he not, he not getting out no time soon, baby, no time soon. And Ricky, as a result of obviously not cooperating, not taking the plea deal, was executed in 2017. And Ray is incarcerated and will remain incarcerated until his last breath. All right guys, so these are our two perpetrators, but um, I was kind of rushing to get to carpool and I left out a couple of things that I want to add before we close out the video. So Ray and Ricky seem to be on a crime spree that started out with the murder of Ricky's then wife, okay? Treva Gray was Ricky Gray's wife in November of 2005, so just about 
a month before, like a little over a month before the murders of the Harvey family, she was found deceased in a ditch. She was badly beaten, but her death was never really looked into because local authorities assumed that she had died as the result of some sort of drug related incident they thought maybe she overdosed and whoever she was with dumped her body there like they did not think that she um was murdered and while her death was ruled suspicious it was never ruled as a murder so no investigation was ever um started her family was very suspicious of ricky gray they urged police to look into them but they did not and right before Travis death Ray had also moved in with them. So it was the three of them living in a home. And once apprehended, once giving his confession, Ray admitted that he and Ricky, well, Ricky had beat Treva to death while Ray held her down. And that this was like the start of their crime spree and them scrambling to get money together because after Treva's death, they no longer had a place to stay because they were renting this home from her family and so obviously after she was found dead suspiciously they evicted him so they no longer had a place to stay and then on december 31st a day before the harvey murders a man by the name of ryan carey was attacked by two men they beat him so bad he was in a coma and he permanently lost the function in his right arm as a result of what ricky and Ray did to him. He was obviously not able to identify them when it happened, but after everything came out in the news and he saw their faces on the news, he was able to identify them as the man or the men who attacked him. And then lastly, Ray admitted to another home invasion on January 3rd, 2006. So in between the Harvey and the Baskerville Tucker family, However, there was no fatalities. Nobody died because the husband and wife in this situation, the wife was disabled and the husband basically pled for her life and Ricky and Ray felt sympathy for her. And so they stole things from the home. They ran off with some cash, but they left the two of them alive. Thank God. And what is baffling to me the most is that Ashley led these people to her family after knowing they killed two people and two kids like what did she think was gonna happen and why did she think she was safe or would be spared after these people killed two little girls i don't know this is just like one of those totally unnecessarily totally avoidable cases like this just ain't have no business happening hop right in today for today's case we are in Arlington Texas I can't think about Arlington Texas without thinking about King of the Hill and it is December 20th 18 1989 December 20th 1989 I'm gonna put my hair back real quick and let our moisturizer sink in for just a few minutes so we're at Lace Gentlemen's Club in Arlington Texas and Lace is a more high-end gentlemen's clubs. It attracted a lot of businessmen and a lot of professional athletes. It was a very high-end spot. A lot of money in and out, a lot of girls, a lot of dancers, a lot of moving parts, okay? So on the morning of the 20th, Jennifer Burns, who is the club's accountant, even though she's only 21 at the time of the events of today's case she's at the club early that morning doing you know the work that she needed to get done and she is with a friend of hers who also works at the club this woman's name is sally sally is a hostess at the club but she and jennifer are also very close friends and they're roommates. So they came into the club together on the morning of the 20th, she and Jennifer. So Jennifer and Sally are upstairs in like the office of the strip club. And Jennifer gets to her job. She's looking over numbers from the night before. And then the two women are later joined by 
the next person scheduled to come in this man's name is clay and he is the daytime manager at lace and they're all scheduled to be in at around 9 30 in the morning but unbeknownst to the women clay is followed in to the strip club by a gunman and this gunman shoots all three of them sally jennifer and clay before stealing cash from the safe and fleeing the scene clay before succumbing to his injuries is able to call 911 so ambulances detectives police all the first responders are called out to the scene clay and sally are taken into the local hospital they both have been shot in the head clay had also been shot in the arm and they are in dire condition jennifer is the worst of the bunch she had been shot three times in the head and in the arm and in the shoulder it's obvious to them that she was also stripped from her clothing but there was no immediate signs of sexual assault. And everybody on the scene is just so confused. Nobody has any idea what happened because their three victims are unable to speak. And since they can't talk to their victims, detective next course of action is to look at surveillance footage to get some type of idea of what the heck had happened and hopefully get an ID on their suspect. But unfortunately for detectives, their assailant had accounted for all of the surveillance cameras and all the cameras had been turned hiding this person's identity and what had exactly happened upstairs in this strip club. So all three victims are at Arlington Memorial and they're all being worked on, okay? They remove matching bullets from all three victims so they know this was probably like a one suspect type of thing there was not multiple weapons used just one man with one gun and shortly after arriving to the hospital jennifer burns is pronounced dead at just 21 years old as a result of the three gunshot wounds she had suffered inside the strip club now jennifer's passing is devastating for several different reasons obviously because she was so young but she had got the job at the strip club because it was kind of like a family thing her mother was the house mom at the strip club y'all know what that is right like she was in, basically in layman's terms like she's the manager over the dancers at the strip club she takes roll call <laughs> at the beginning of the shift she makes sure all the dancers are there she makes sure they have enough dancers she makes sure that the dancers have everything they need during their shift things of that nature so Jennifer's mom was the house mom at Lace and Jennifer's sister had also worked as Lace, at Lace as well as a bartender. So the family was like familiar with the strip club and obviously the strip club was familiar with the family. But Jennifer was working at the strip club to put herself through school. She was paying for all of her tuition on her own, doing accounting at the strip club. And she was said to be like, the breakout star of the family, like the one person in the family that her family thought was gonna go all the way. She was gonna go to school, get a great job, you know, really be living that ideal life, graduating high school, graduating college, getting your dream job, and like, you know, making a lot of money the right, the right proper way, you know? She had a great head on her shoulders and her future was extremely bright. Now, Sally and Clay are still in the ICU fighting for their lives. Like I said, they both had gun injuries to the head and detectives were just hoping that eventually they'd be in a state to where they could talk to police. So detectives can't really talk to their victims. So they have to go back to the scene and like analyze their crime scene. They learned from the owners of the strip club that it was exactly $11,000 missing from the safe. So their perpetrator had made it off with $11,000 in cash and more specifically so, small bills, okay? So this person was walking around and with $11,000 in loose ones basically, okay? Which is hard to spend. So they have local banks keeping an eye out for anyone 
coming in trying to swap out small bills for large bills. They also learn from the owners of the strip club that whoever this was had some kind of knowledge of the ins and outs of the strip club, where the cameras were, where this upstairs office was that they kept the safe, how to get into the safe, what time they needed to be there to get into the safe. Like whoever this was, was familiar with the ins and outs of the strip club and had put some thought into it. They also know that this person is familiar with the strip club because not only did they take real cash money, Lace was one of those strip clubs to where you could exchange your money for like the strip club currency and spend that currency within the strip club. Kind of like Usher Bucks, you remember Usher Bucks? Like the whole Usher Bucks debacle. Doing this keeps men from like holding on to that money. Like once you exchange it for the strip club currency, you have to spend it because you can't spend it nowhere else. You know, it keeps men from like getting out a stack of money from the ATM, pulling out 500, 600, a thousand dollars and just holding on to it all night. You know what I'm saying? Like once you cash that money in, baby, you gotta spend it. You gotta tip somebody. You gotta throw it because you can't spend it nowhere else. So they're like, damn, he took the strip club currency. Is he trying to come back to spend it? Cause like he knows he can't use it anywhere else. So is this person after robbing and shooting three people in the head about to try to come back up in this strip club and spin their currency that he stole? You gotta have some big balls. So while they didn't really have a suspect, they know that this is somebody who is in some way very familiar with the strip club and is definitely a face that's gonna be familiar to employees once they figure out who it actually is. It was not a random thing. So there are a couple of witnesses. I don't know if these people were like in the parking lot waiting for it to open or what, but they were in the parking lot and saw the assailant fleeing the scene. <clears throat> they said it was a man with facial hair who seemed to be in his 30s and looked to be about six foot tall. They said this man fleed the scene in like an older model car and these two witnesses in the parking lot go in to do a composite sketch. And once the composite sketch is done, employees feel like the sketch matches a man who was recently fired from the strip club. This man's name was Mitch and Mitch was fired just a week before the burglary, robbery, murder situation. So they bring Mitch in for questioning and Mitch tells detectives that it wasn't him. He said he had been fired, but he got fired because he didn't really take the job seriously. He was just goofing off and so he wasn't really surprised when they fired him, which I can totally relate to. I've had so many jobs. Well, not really so many jobs, but every job I've worked, especially since I've started doing social media. It's just like, how do y'all keep me employed here? I'm not listening to nobody. I'm not showing up on time. I'm cussing everybody out and y'all still let me clock in every day. That's wild. But Mitch was on the same type of time. He wasn't surprised that they let him go. Mitch ultimately has an alibi about 20 minutes away from the crime scene at the time that the whole robbery slash shooting was happening so they initially so they ultimately are able to rule him out even though the witnesses pick him out of a lineup he just must look a lot a lot like the guy who had robbed the strip club and his story is later bolstered by someone who works for lace but at a separate building like a separate more corporate building for lace this woman says she was actually on the phone with jennifer and sally that morning they were having a quick conversation and they were saying that on their way in that morning they were being harassed by someone who was trying to get into the building and this man was walking around the parking lot and so this woman from this corporate office for Lace told the girls to get off the phone with her and to call Clay and let him know, you know, before he left his home that there was someone, a random person trying to get into the building 
in the parking lot and to you know watch out for him when he pulled up but unfortunately clay had seemingly already left for work and they were just getting his voicemail so they left him a voicemail but this is important to detectives because the lady on the phone says that the girls did not know who this person was and if it was mitch they would have been able to identify him and tell her exactly who it was but they didn't because they didn't know so this wasn't somebody that was necessarily familiar to the girls or clay and the woman says that by the time she had called back to check on the situation, all hell had already broke loose, okay? So whereas detectives at first were thinking this was definitely somebody the girls would have known and Clay would have known because he knew the ins and out of the strip club, they're wondering if they're just dealing with like a really skilled criminal who has done multiple robberies in the past. So another dancer comes forward to say that she was concerned that maybe her boyfriend had something to do with the attack. She said she had recently put her boyfriend out, that he was a drug addict and he was not working. She was paying for everything and he was abusive. So she had recently put him out because he had made her increasingly uncomfortable. He had also been in and out of jail for drug charges and for robbery as well. So detectives know they want to look into him, but they want to know from the dancer, you know, why, what other things that were leading her to believe that he may be involved. She said leading up to the attacks, he was asking about the ins and outs of the strip club, when they took the money out, when they took the money to the bank, how much money was brought in every night, where was the safe, how did the cameras work? Like he was asking real heisty like questions, like he was trying to plan something. But as they're trying to look into this dancer's boyfriend, detectives get a call that throws the investigation in like the opposite direction and gives them a really solid suspect. A security guard in Fort Worth, Texas calls in because of suspicious behavior from a former colleague. The security guard said that his colleague, Adam, exclaimed and claimed that he was dating Jennifer Burns and that they had recently broken up and he was really torn up about it. But the security guard didn't hear anything about this before, just after the attacks. And it was just really weird to him. He didn't like it, it didn't feel right. Detectives look closer into this and what they realize is that Adam Crosby is not something, is not somebody who was familiar to Jennifer. He wasn't familiar to the dancers in the club, but he was kicked out recently by security because he was looking for Jennifer and he was trying to get into the strip club but security you know wouldn't let him in and he ended up getting so aggressive with the bouncers for not letting him in that they had to physically pick him up and throw him out of the strip club and then after this he had sent Jennifer flowers so they're wondering if this was some type of stalker situation so they need to talk to Adam expeditiously and then other people at Adam's job confirmed to detectives his mental state has not been the best. He actually had to take a few leaves of absence. Did I say that right? Leaves of absence because he, he wasn't all there. He was struggling with something mentally. And so they bring Adam in for questioning and they're even more alarmed by the way Adam presents himself in this interview, he's telling detectives that he and Jennifer were in a relationship and that they were in love, but he doesn't really know anything about Jennifer. He just tells them a bunch of vague things. He didn't know anything about the ins and out of her day life, everyday life. He didn't know where she lived. Like they obviously were not in a relationship. Everything was one-sided coming from Adam. And obviously this was also alarming to detectives because they found Jennifer, you know, without some of her clothing on. No signs of assault, but she, something happened, obviously, you know. Adam also reported to work every day at 12 p.m. So he very well could have done this at 9.30 in the morning and then went on about the rest of his day per usual. It's a piece of fun. And police are pretty sure that Adam is their guy, but they don't have any physical evidence yet to link him to the crime scene. They don't yet have their murder weapon, so they have to continue to dig and look. 
But luckily they don't have to dig too much further because Clay is finally able to talk to detectives. He's awake, he's up and well enough to give his account of what happens and he remembers quite vividly. Clay says that on the morning of the 20th, he arrived, he was in the parking lot and he was approaching the locked door to the strip club that he had keys to. And as he was approaching the door, someone came out from behind a pole and pressed the gun to his chest and told him, you know, you gotta let me in. And Clay felt as though he didn't have any other choice. He says the gunman had him turn away the cameras as they were about to pass each one so that he wouldn't be seen on the camera footage. Clay went on to say that he didn't recognize this man, but he realized that this man knew exactly where each one of the cameras were, and he knew exactly where the safe was. He was very familiar with the ins and outs of the strip club, though Clay had never seen him before. Clay said he originally thought this would just be a robbery and then everybody would be set free. This man would go off with the money and they would be okay. But he says that after the man collected the money, he instructed for Elizabeth to take her clothes off and that he had actually tried to sexually assault Elizabeth, but he couldn't, couldn't, yeah. And so they felt as though this is what kind of escalated the situation. Maybe he didn't go in there with the intent of using the gun, but after he tried to do what he tried to do and couldn't make it do what it do, you know what I'm saying? He was embarrassed and then, just started shooting. Most importantly for detectives, Clay confirms that he does not know who this person is. So detectives are still unsure of where to turn. Shortly after Clay is able to talk to police, Sally is ready to talk to police as well, but because of Sally's gunshot wounds, she cannot talk just yet so she's able to give a statement in writing and she tells detectives what had happened before clay got there and she says as she and jennifer were trying to enter the building this man approached them saying that he had left his wallet the night before and they were immediately uneasy because right off the bat they knew that this man was lying because he said he had left his wallet and the front desk had called him and told him to come pick it up that morning. But Sally was the hostess. She would have been the person to call and she did not make this phone call. So they both knew in this moment that he was full of shit and he probably had some sort of negative evil intention. And so Clay and Sally are able to give a new composite sketch. Since they are the people who saw this person like face to face, they weren't just like bystanders in a car. And this second composite sketch also garners a lot of attention from the public. Everybody thinks it's somebody, but they're able to pull all these people and show their pictures to Sally and Clay, but Sally and Clay don't identify any of the men shown to them as the person who attacked them on the morning of the 20th. So again, detectives are kind of at a standstill. They're able to rule out all of their previous suspects because Clay and Sally can't identify any of the people shown to them, but they still don't have a suspect. They don't have the next place to go. So detectives finally get another lead from someone who recognized the composite sketch and was able to put two and two together with an event that had happened in their life. But this man had taken some time to get an attorney to make sure he did this the right way because he didn't want to make himself look guilty, okay? So this man tells detectives through his attorney that on the morning of the robbery and the murder, a man that he used to trade stocks with on the stock market named David Herman came to his home with a big duffel bag full of cash in small bills and threatened his life and threatened his kid's life. He said that David Herman told him, I need you to go to the bank and exchange this money for me for larger bills or I'm going to kill your kid. 
and it was exactly eleven thousand dollars in small bills he said at first he didn't put two and two together but once he saw the composite sketch and once he realized you know that it was stolen from a strip club and it would be all these small bills he put two and two together and decided to come to detectives so they decided to look into david herman because at this point this is the most credible lead that they have and what they find out is that david's wife drives a car similar to the car witnesses saw the assailant drive off in but like i said like we've been saying this person knows the ins and outs of the club so they want to know if david lee herman has any ties to lace so they call up the owners of the strip club and they ask the owners if they know david herman come to find out david herman was the first manager at the strip club when it like first opened and ultimately both sally and clay are able to identify david herman through a picture as the person who attacked them on that morning and so they go out to scoop him up immediately they approach him as like an armed and dangerous suspect it's a whole SWAT team situation they roll up on David expecting him to be combative but he's actually pretty chill and he says he knows exactly why they're there and he's willing to give detectives a full confession he says that he had been working hard and just like not doing the best financially he just wanted more more and more he had tried his hand at the stock market that didn't work out for him and he felt like he was a hard working guy that just wasn't making enough money and so this is when he decided to commit a robbery he said lace was his first choice because he was familiar and he went in on the 20th because Christmas was right around the corner. He says that once he got in, he was really excited. He was feeling powerful where he had just been kind of feeling helpless in society and he liked the way it made him feel. And he did not initially go in with the intent of assaulting anyone, but tried to do so after the fact and was unable to. Same as Clay said. And while he admitted to everything, he wouldn't go into great detail. And he said after shooting him, he left because he just assumed they were all dead. But luckily, they weren't. And then he took the money to this person to try to get them to exchange the bills for him out of fear. But luckily, this person did not give in and they went directly to the police. And this was probably David's biggest mistake, trying to get this money switched out. He should have just been going around spinning ones on everything because then he got caught. So after giving a full confession, he takes detectives to the weapon he used. He had buried it near his work off the interstate. So they book him for the murder, the robbery, attempted murder, all of that. And Jennifer didn't know David, but her mother did and her sister did from working in the club. They were familiar with him that way and they also went to David's mother's nail salon all the time. His mother owned a nail salon that the family frequented, which is crazy. So when the family was told who it was, you know, they know they knew exactly who he was. It's crazy. And for whatever reason, once the matter is taken to trial, David decides to take back his confession and plead not guilty. Whatever. Um, but obviously we have our two surviving witnesses and the murder weapon, so he don't have to confess. So the jury deliberated for 15 minutes before finding him guilty and sentencing him to death by lethal injection. At the age of 39, David was put to death. But the day before he was executed, you guys, he tried to himself so the day before his execution he was brought into a hospital they patched him up sewed him up he tried to slit his throat and his wrist they literally treated his wounds and then executed his ass the next day bam And that was in April of 1997. So goodness gracious, that is a wrap on today's case. 
And my thing is, was he looking to go back to the strip club after seemingly, he thought he had killed three people. He was gonna take the strip club currency back to the strip club and spend it after committing a triple homicide? You got to know he is roasting like a hot dog in the hottest pits of hell right now. <laughs>